Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, our special guest is my long-lost twin brother, Johannes Getahun Melke. And this is a very interesting individual. I'll tell you something that somebody said about me, and I'm going to reflect it on my brother, who I'm going to introduce you to today. So something that somebody said to me is that they had encountered many Ethiopians, and they had countered many Americans. What they had never seen is someone who, the way in which the Lord is futsum saw, futsum amlak, or fully human and fully divine, he said he's never met somebody who was futsum Ethiopiawi, futsum Amerikawi, or fully Ethiopian and fully American. Now, if we expand that word American, not just to the United States, but to all of North America, and more specifically Canada, you get my brother Johannes, who was born and raised in Canada, but I would put his knowledge of Ge'ez, Amharic, and English against anyone born in Canada, anyone born in the United States, and frankly, anyone born in any English-speaking diaspora. Welcome to the show, Johannes and Dethna. Hello, Lewis. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Today, we're going to tackle Amharic aphorisms. And just to, to kind of highlight and flex on a lot of you, the levels of Amharic that you can reach, even though you're born in the diaspora, to take excuses away, because our parents were, were here for, for quite a while. I think mine a little bit earlier than his, but still, they were here in, in the West for quite a while before we got here. And yet, both of us, Obviously, we started with the base of our parents teaching us Amharic, but beyond that, we spent our own time and our own energy. We put in our effort to learn about our culture further, and we're going to show you the pinnacle of that by going through Amharic aphorisms or Yamarinya Abbaaluch. So we're going to say them in Amharic, and then we're going to have either brief or long discussions depending on the worthiness of, of each saying. And to, to really flex on you all, what we did today is we didn't prepare for this a lot in advance. About 5, 10, maybe 15 minutes in advance, I hit Johannes up and I said, yo, let's look at these Amharic aphorisms. And we don't even have them properly written in English somewhere. We're really doing this off the cuff to give you a nice organic conversation to show you how you can use your curiosity and your play with language learning to continue to be proud of, of the heritage you came from. Johannes, since you're the guest today and they always get to hear my Lif Lafa, I'm going to give you precedent. Hit us with uh, any order of the words, whether you know chronologically in the, in the order that you wrote it or out of order, but hit us with any of them. And then if you ever want to hear from any of uh, the ones I've written down, I think you have a few more than I do, then we can go to, to my aphorisms as well. Yeah, we can do, we can, I think we can do like a... I feel I got like around 20 that I wanted to go through. I think you got around 10. So if we go, if we go to like a, on a two to one ratio, I think, I think that'll work out and we'll like, we'll be at the end of our list. Sounds good. You'll jab the audience twice and I'll hit them with a hook. With the hook. <laughs> Left hook, right hook type of thing. Yeah, I know. That's good. That's good. So we'll pro I'll probably just like say it in a modern up first. Yes, um, please. We'll, we'll try and give a, uh, English, like a literal, a dynamic, um, and then kind of delve into the kind of the, the, the I guess the cultural value or whatever is hidden behind that that saying there. So I'll, I'll go out right off the start. Um, one of one of one of the ones that took me a long time. It's pretty long one. It took me a long time to to learn. I never really got it at the beginning. I moton sitisha idem meten afin chatasha tanich. So I being mouse. Um, when, when, when a mouse is looking to die or looking to commit suicide, she goes around and starts sniffing the nose of a cat, is the, is the direct translation there. And I guess dynamic, what they're trying to talk about is how people that are, that, that are look are like that their demise is upon them or are looking to fall from, from whatever position or wherever they are. A complete, a complete demise of themselves with regards to, let's say, its work, life, whatever it is, starts like delving into things that they shouldn't be. 
associating with or being around, etc. Um, to me, like from an Ethiopian context, that kind of like brings out um, ideas where we're very like hierarchical in our in our society. So someone that's let's say uh, let's let's take a church angle, and someone that's like a soldier or something shouldn't doesn't go into the Methodist and start um, messing around with whatever is the priests, right? Like and the same thing with with let's say a, a royal family or whatever it is up there, or even let's say in the house, like a child and an elder, like an, a father or something like that. Um, and to me, this 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 saying just kind of like really brings brings to to the front of my mind that very like hierarchical and um, very kind of specialized in an educational sense where you, you kind of each each person has their function in the society and you you, know, you don't you don't do things that you're not supposed to that and that would if you do that'll just bring on your demise like a mouse is not supposed to be chilling with a with a with a <laughs> with a cat right <laughs> or else it's 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 bad for her in the end you got anything to say on that one or you want me to jump in the next one? no i like that so i just have two quick things to say the first is like yeah those who have a death wish or who are suicidal right it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy when uh, in in the church we have this language when the priests do the the prayer of release uh, they say whatever you've done in your thoughts and your words and in your deeds. So thoughts, words, and deeds, and it's this river that flows. And so I think it begins with the, the suicidal or death wishing thoughts. It leads to the way in which your, your speech patterns change, and then it leads to your actions. And I think it's it's sort of an analysis about the logical, the logical conclusion of people who dwell on these thoughts too long. So I think it, this saying is a way of discouraging the dwelling on these thoughts like it's not that you can't ever have them that's human to have them but to prevent them from dwelling you know one speaker one time was speaking about sin and he said it's okay if a bird poops on your head what are you going to do but don't let them build a bird's nest on your head and so <laughs> i think i think that that gets to the point another aspect to your point about the hierarchy and stratification all human societies have had that in fact you know jordan peterson has gotten into some trouble for talking about how even crustaceans have hierarchy. And so maybe it's something deep in biology, you know, it, it, throughout the animal kingdom of which humankind is, is a part, however controversial that is to some folks in our audience. But the, the bigger point I think is in contrast to where you and I were born and raised in the West. I think there's a balance. A lot of people build these dichotomies and binaries. They say it's either this or it's that. And I think usually it's a blend of the two. And I think we stand in a unique position between the East and the West, uh, which itself is, you know, a little fake binary. Talk about the American Ethiopian experience. I think the North American experience has bought into this blank slate theory too much, where they think that biological sex differences, differences uh, amongst people of, of various categories, are irrelevant and that each person, you know, could try their hardest and get out of any situation that they're in. And I think it's foolhardy when you think that way, because there are certain biological facts about humankind that act, um, again, to quote Peterson, he talked about it like a chess game. Mm -hmm. In chess, you have a million or more options of how to play the game but you're bound by the actual rules of the game. So you have all these options. You don't have unlimited options, but you sure have a lot of them, but they are bound by the rules of the game. We are bound by the rules of biology, but that doesn't mean we have only like two or three options. It still means we have plenty of options. In the Ethiopian situation, I think they have the reverse issue. So if I was preaching to North Americans, I'd say, y'all need to think about biology more. If I'm preaching to Ethiopians, I say, you need to think about biology less and you need to think about these hierarchies or the stratification a little looser and be more, more willing to think about how people can move through the society in mo in a, with mobility and you know, to expand your horizon. 
in education culture, they call it having a growth mindset that if you don't think you can change, then, you know, again, that feeds into your speech and your, in your patterns of behavior so that it might actually prevent you from being able to change much like the, the placebo, um, the placebo effect that's well documented in medicine. By the way, I forgot to, uh, to mention for all of your dental needs in Canada, please hit up Johannes. Uh, he, we were having a funny conversation about functionality before we got on here. So I did not introduce him as Dr. Johannes. But if you happen to ever find yourself needing your Sina Nihomu, needing your Tersoch getting to taken care of or your teeth taken care of, he's the man to hit up. I'm going to plug my boy right now. So sorry, that's enough for that first one. We can go on to the next. Okay, I'll go on to the next one there. Yejib uh, chikulit andi naksal. The hasty hyena uh, bites on horns is the direct translation here. Um, and I guess what, kind of the English equivalent would be um, similar to haste makes waste, but more in terms of haste does damage to yourself. It you hurts you. You, you don't, it doesn't benefit you. Um, and to me, I, this, I mean, it always, it always comes back to, like, when my mom and stuff used to say when I was a kid, like, to not, like, like, think, like, be calm, think, and then act before you act type of thing, or else the consequences of your action in a hasty manner will not be good. And not, like, not that you won't be successful. Like, in one sense, the, the hyena, in this case, does not get the meat. Number one, so there's no benefit, but even worse than that, if he bites into a horn, he could like literally do damage to his to his his, his mouth, right? Or his teeth or whatever it is. Um so that's great that, saying that, for a dentist. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, so that's what I'm thinking. It just comes back to like when I was when I was young and I'm always like, You're a kid, you're excited, you just want to get into things, but thinking before you act is always uh, a good thing to do. And and then when we take it back to an Ethiopian context, um, like it kind of gives me like, especially like thinking before you speak and how like a chawa um, per se is not quick to, to talk. Um, they're more chimit, they're more like reserved um, in, their, in their speech. And they always kind of think like in multiple different avenues of like in what ways what they're saying can be interpreted before saying it in order to like not offend anyone or bring harm to themselves. So you got to know who you're with before you say anything because it could be detrimental to you, right? You got anything to say on that one? Yeah, first a quick anecdote. I was with my boy Pat in college. We were probably playing basketball at the time. And I remember I said this to him. I don't remember the exact context. And he turned to me and he's like, bruh, you know, we're all black, but sometimes I forget you're African. And when you said this, I remembered, oh yeah, this dude's African. <laughs> because he's like, you talk about hyenas and stuff. Like even the word usage, he's like, I don't know nothing about no hyenas. So <laughs> yeah. it was just the, that fact stuck out to him. And then I think it's very interesting that we have some paradoxes and tensions, I think, within our, our culture. Professor Masfin Waldemariam talked about how our culture and society is very communal, and yet there's this huge individualism streak. And he says, you want to see the most obvious place? He says, look at what the sport is that we're the best at. They say it's a team sport, but really it's an individual sport, which is running. And he says, we're terrible at soccer, which requires this mass organization, and, um, you know, this ability to be real, like organized. Yeah, and your, your organization theory has got to be on point. And so I think what this point highlights is this streak of great men in our society who have been great critical thinkers. For me, the pinnacle of which is Alek Agabrahanna, but we could say really most of the Aleka people with that mm -hmm. title. And, uh, and yet... I think a lot of the tradition actually represses question asking and, and this saying might get misinterpreted to you're talking about being like being reserved to being silent all the time. 
Mm-hmm. But I think if we see like, you know, in the Bible, in, in Timothy, it tells the people who are getting ordained to be to be reserved people. And in James, it tells people to be slow to speak and quick to hear. So I think overall, it's it's good advice, you know, not to make haste and not to be a hyena biting a horn. And, mm-hmm. and we got to watch out. It's very cinematic. You know, I felt it in my teeth. You probably felt it even more again because of your profession. But I, I felt it when when I heard you pronounce it. And this is one of the ones that you and I had common to us. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. One one thing to add on to what you just said, I heard like about Ethiopian individualism. I heard, I think I read it in a book. I'm, I'm not sure where exactly, but it was it was talking about like what what is the first thing an Ethiopian does when they come into some type of money, like back home is the first thing they do if they don't have it already is build a big gate around their house. <laughs> <laughs> and and, that, and they're just saying like, that's just like how individualistic we are. We're like, we're, cause it's weird, we're, right? Pardon? It's weird. Given the, the hospital, like the, 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 the hospitality culture. Yeah. And like when you, I guess like, like going back to uni, like psych 101, there were like the communal societies and the individualistic were considered like the West and then the Eastern part of the world is very kind of communal and stuff. Um, but it's not black and white, obviously, right? There's, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting in any Ethiopian context. I'll go to the next one. Or is it your oh, I thought we're going two and one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, I'm crossing off the the hyena one because I had that was my first one actually. So she was trying to grab the beehive, but as she's trying to grab the beehive, there's something in her armpit, and what was in her armpit, she actually dropped it. I think this one is similar to another one that I've heard of, and I'm you know I have actually forgotten the other one now. But it's funny, some are coming to me, so I actually added to my list while we're while we're talking, just because they're randomly coming to me as we're talking. But I think the purpose of this one is to say be grateful for what you have. I would relate it to the Americanism, the grass is greener on the other side. So I, I think everyone always longs for something else, but sometimes you have to be appreciative of, of what you have. Actually, the other one, the other one came to me. I'm going to, I'm going to throw it in there. I actually did not have this one written. Uh, I think it's related. So I'm going to, I'm going to say this one. But um, work. So the gold that was in your hand, it was counted as if it was bronze. So I think, again, it's the same idea. Be grateful. Have Gratitude is the right attitude. Appreciate what you have. In the context of Johannes and I, we are so appreciative of this long legacy of Ethiopian studies that we had. So many giants, so many greats that we've taken our time, not just to assimilate in the Canadian and the United States cultures, which we have. You could hear him rep the the Raptors. And even though I'm wearing a Miami jersey, I don't like Miami. It's because I like Andre Iguodala. I'm a Clippers fan. You could hear us rave and rant about the Clippers and about the Toronto Raptors. At the same time, here we are teaching you about Amharic aphorisms. And so we're able to grab both. It's not this or that. It's yes and. And so be grateful for what you have. And for us, you know, it's our, it's our curse and our worse, our inheritance and our, our culture. Yeah. And one, one thing I'll, I'll add to that um, point that you raised beyond being grateful, like you, it also, like you will lose what you have as well by, by not being grateful, right? It's not just like you... Like you're not grateful, but you still have that. You can access it at any time. It's like, no, you will lose what you have if you don't kind of um, appreciate it and and kind of take care of it, right? Another another in an, another sense in which I understand that that saying there um, is similar to um, the English idiom, like um, what is it called? A, a bird in the hand is worth two birds in the bush. Yes. Um, where 
like you have you have to first value what you have a good grasp of and what is within your control before you become overly ambitious and try to obtain more right so like being greedy um is also so that's the thing a lot of these things like you can like you'll you'll be in situations where you hear something and you'll apply a tarot to it and then you'll be in another situation and that same model will apply it's just from a different a different kind of aspect right so i'm sure like a lot of these like we can we can kind of take them um look at them from different angles um and kind of have different understandings I mean, it might, it might take us a couple hours, three hours, four hours show, but... We'll do that, man. You you actually just inspired me to give a new meaning to the one that we just talked about. So whether it's the gold in your hand being counted as, as if it's bronze, or you're reaching for the beehive and dropping what was in your armpit, what you were holding in your armpit. Mm -hmm. I used to work in a court, and when I worked in a court, I had 60 cases, 54 of them, all of them litigated, 54 of them, which I helped the disputants settle with okay. a written settlement agreement. And the advice that I always gave them is you can always walk away from the mediator and you can go to the judge. If you go to the judge, you guys are gamblers. If you go to the judge, you don't know what could happen and the consequences are dire. Mm -hmm. If you settle right now, you know what the agreement is going to be because you are the ones who are going to write it. And so exactly like you said, like the applicability is in so many sectors and fields of our life. Yeah. So kind of the, way, the way you just said that, like with the judge, with the court, kind of reminds me of, uh, I think in economics or something, about the game theory or something, where you're, I think the, the typical example is the, is like you're, you're, being, you're in front of like a, an investigator or something and your friend is in another place. But if you both deny it, you're both free. But if your friend denies it and you don't, then you get like double the sentence or something. I don't know. You probably, you probably know it, but a little more in your field. But yeah, no, that's right. It's a that's a it's a pro snitching technique that they that they try to get. What what those game theorists miss out on is the kind of the values of like loyalty, which is you know rakikno. It's a very non corporeal value. You know, some people have loyalty as a value. Some people don't. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Hit us with oh, another one. I, I snuck it. I snuck in a second one. So you, you hit, hit us in. Don't worry. So it's, yeah, it's, it was along, it was along the same line. So, um, is a, is a short one, and literally, Alshashun Zoralu translates to like they they didn't retreat; they just turned around. Like they didn't retreat, they turned around. But the idea behind it is that Al Shashum and Zoralu are are words that sound different, they're different words, but they basically mean the same thing. So whether you retreat or turn around, you're still you're still like trying to avoid engagement with whatever it is, like a war or whatever whatever it is. Um so you're just trying to say the same thing, but say two different ways. Um, so meshesh in has more of a... Sorry, I'm getting a phone call. I don't know if... I was going to say dimse raka. Huh? I was going to say dimse raka, but it's back. I can't hear you now. Can you hear me? The... Let's see. Speaker. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. How's it now? It's good. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so meshesh is like, um, I guess it kind of has to do maybe with the tone or like the diction. Diction might be the good, the good saying where it, it has, it, the connotation that it creates in your mind is one of fear, one of not wanting to engage in a battle. Um, like, like stuff like that where it's like you're, you're a scaredy cat or whatever, you know what I mean? But like Zoralu has more of a positive connotation. So you're trying to make the situation better by using terminology that doesn't elicit the same kind of response in the mind, but literally means the same thing. Um, so it's kind of like a don't beat around the bush, just like, 
like say say what say what it is. And you just like when I see it brought up is, um, like when someone's arguing with you and it's like, no, they did this. Um, this you explain. This is what happened. Then he says, no, no, no actually, this is what happened. Then he says, Aisha from Zohar, you know, it's, you, we're basically saying the same thing. You have anything to add to that? Yeah, so I have done five and a half years of the Korean kickboxing known as Taekwondo. I'm in my third year, uh, give or take, you know, some breaks in between of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And I have been watching the UFC and other combat sports for a long time. So on the side, you could say not my academic field, but my kind of one of my passions is fighting. And in fighting, there are three main areas that I think if you study, you'll know whether or not someone's going to win. And ultimately, you know, there's a bit of chance in there, but and and how styles meet up. But it's it's essentially strength, which I include strength over time, not just a little bit. So that includes endurance. So strength, technique, and tactics. We'll put strength and technique aside for now. What this is talking about is fleeing versus turning around. And that's an intent thing, like you've said. It's a state of mind. It's a mentality. But it's also about tactics, okay? And so I think part of it is like philosophizing, you know, the situation. Anybody could look at a di the same set of facts and come away with a different point of view or perspective, depending on what they bring to the table and what they want to bring away from the table. We look at the, the crucifixion of Jesus and the people who were there, they thought that they defeated him. But what, af what actually happened is he was defeating them. He was making a public spectacle of them. It was the reverse. So it, it matters what you bring to the table, what information you have to assess the situation. The enemy might think you're fleeing, but you know you're just turning around. You know what I'm saying? So you don't have a perfect information. So you're responding. So I think this is a question of, of tactics and what are the different tactics of either fleeing or, or turning around? Mm -hmm. No, that's good. I don't have much to add to it. So I'll just jump to the next one. Please. Um, um, the ox, <laughs> the cow, um, dwells with the person that's going to slaughter him uh, is, the, is the direct translation there. Um, the, the, the type of the situation that I see this one come up a lot is when people don't know who their friends and enemies are and they're hanging around with their enemies, like people that, that are trying to get them type of thing. Um, and it, it could be for various reasons. Sometimes, I mean, like, sometimes you know he's your enemy or she's your enemy, and you're still, like, you're still hanging around with that person. I remember in school a lot where, like, you'll, you'll, you'll see people that just, like, kind of hang out with each other, but, like, behind, when they're not with that person, they're, they're like, talking, like, bad stuff about that person, but then they're still with that person, and they're, they're like, backstabbing that person. You know, that kind of stuff, that type of stuff. Um, so Bari Karajula is, is one that I see brought up a lot um, around those types of situations where people are hanging out with people that don't like them and whether they know it or not. You got anything to add? It's interesting that some of these sayings are normative and some of them are descriptive. Normative means some of them are telling you what to do. Descriptive means some of them are just describing things as they are and then want you to come to your own conclusions based off of their description of human behavior. This is one of the ones that's descriptive. It's not, it's not explicitly telling you what to do, but maybe it's making you cognizant of something so that you could come to your own conclusions about the matter. There's an American equivalent that actually is telling you what to do. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Mm -hmm. So it's the normative version of this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think that's the situation that I see. I see it coming up with in the most is those types of situations. So, and and a lot of the time it's like after the fact too, where like something happens and then like they really like split up and then but they they've been with each other. Let's say it might even be like a, in a, in a like a husband and wife type of thing too. Um, and it's like yeah, buddy, Karaju, like she's been with the person that's that's gonna slaughter her for like whatever this many years or some of that. Anyway, I'll jump to the next one if you got anything to add. 
Yesim fits you with Ethan Amju, which translates to um, grind it anywhere. Just bring me the the dough or the uh, the, the the flour. Um, I don't or like I don't care where you grind it as long as I get the flour type of thing. Um, Actually, this one I, I heard uh, recently. There's a there's a place in uh, in Wallo, close to Desi, called Hike Hike Estefanos. It's a it's a monastery. And there's a lake. There's actually like a hike, a lake in that area. And the the, the kind of the tale behind it is there's this poor woman who who had to she literally she grinded like seeds or, or grains for a living. So some rich lady comes and tells her, "Okay, grind this cake for me and bring me the uh, bring me the ducat, the flour." And the the poor lady was tired that night, and she literally slept at the wafto rate and didn't grind the grain. But in the morning, when she woke up, the grain was already was grinded. And like I guess in a dream or a vision or something, the Virgin Mary told her that she was the one who did it for her. So she takes this flower to the rich woman and says, it's, here it is. And the rich woman says, how, could, how did you grind it? Like, I didn't hear the wolf troll, like the, 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 the rocks kind of like going against each other. I didn't, I didn't hear any noise all night. Like, how did you do it? And then she tells her that what happened. She, she fell asleep and the Virgin Mary came and um, ground, the, ground, the, ground the flower, the, into, the grain into flour for her. And then she says, okay, if you weren't the one who grounded the, the the grain then you don't deserve the wages that i was going to give you and at this time the poor woman goes to the people of the city the elders and she she kind of tells them what happened and then there's a, a chilot or like a third and half the shamadunes kind of judge um on the side of the rich woman while the other half in favor of the poor woman and the story goes that, and this is the, the, the creation story for that lake, is that the a water, water sprouted out from the ground and kind of sank all the, the people, the, the elders who sided with the rich woman. Um, and then the elders that sided with the poor woman said, You're, the purpose of the, of, the, of the payment is for you to get the flower. It's yetun fichu, duketun amchu. It doesn't matter how you go about it. The main thing is that the end product is is obtained um so it's kind of the the ends um I, we, we can we can take it into a sense of like the ends justify the means um in the sense that like what's the morality for for earning money is it not the labor that you put into that into that in that the task or whatever it is but if no labor was invested do you deserve a wage? But in this in this sense, I think it's neglecting the, that idea of like w wages are given for labor. So the the the, the intent or the, the ethics or whatever it is behind like payment should be kind of put to the side as long as the end product is is achieved. You got anything to add? Yeah, it sounds like it, this is a very early critique of Marxism. Number one, it throws the Virgin Mary in there. And so it, there's there's no room for religion in Marxism. So the Virgin Mary comes and smashes uh, Marxism that way. And then the second thing you're saying is that it smashes the Marxist view, which is called the labor theory of value, that the labor that you put into it imbues it magically with uh, its own price as opposed to the kind of subjective value that it gets on the marketplace from the various people that would do that. So that's very interesting that this, this story would critique Marxism probably before Marxism came around. Definitely before it came around in Ethiopia. Yeah, I think it's definitely an interesting one. Uh, and and it's actually recently, probably like two, three years ago, I, like I know the saying is that I actually heard the story behind it. Um, I was just watching some video on YouTube on Heike Stefanos and the lady was just telling the story behind how the lake came to be and stuff and she brought she brought up this. Um, that's where I heard it. I'll jump it's beautiful. In. I'll 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 jump in with uh, another one here. 
I, I keep getting I keep getting random ones. I'm I'm up to 15 myself, so I'm <laughs> I'm almost as competitive as you now. Uh, so laware fre yellow. There is no fruit, or it's not fruitful, to have wedding. Every time we're at a dinner table, my dad used to say this to us, and it used to crack me up. Their idea of like what was the way to eat is everybody comes to the table. You eat all your food first. And you don't even have your drink. You have your drink at the end. Nobody says anything to anybody. Once you've finished your food portion and you've moved to the drink portion, then you're allowed to talk. Otherwise, you're not allowed to talk. So that's kind of the context in which I heard this. Like it, this was born into my head. I heard this saying probably more more than most of the other ones that I've I've written down. And I think what it means to talk. So, or conversation, but it also has this connotation, like you were talking about connotations earlier, a negative connotation. Like there is an idea of talking too much. I watched the the musical Hamilton recently, and the the kind of foils in the musical are Aaron Burr, the character of Aaron Burr, and the character of Alexander Hamilton. Sorry for delving too much in the American history for you. Very important uh, people though in American history, and Burr was more Ethiopian in this sense. He always says, keep your cards close to your chest. Don't talk too much. Alexander Hamilton's the exact opposite. He would go on every mountaintop and talk too much. I, I think in learning from this saying, but also being in the, Ma the West growing up in America, have come up with my own blend where I think relatively to my parents and, and people, they're from the city. So people who are more country than them, I think the deeper you go into the country, the deeper this culture of, of a secret society exists. Everybody, you know, knowledge is power. Don't share things with people. Somebody might steal your idea, you know, things like that. I think I am far more loud mouthed than they are. However, when I'm compared to, I think, my peers whom I grew up with in Los Angeles in America, I think I'm far more secretive and mysterious. I've had people tell me, you're so mysterious. And I'm like, really? I'm mysterious? I feel like I'm an open book. But I've had several people in my life tell me how mysterious I am. And they don't know what my politics are. Or they don't know what this and that and a third are. And I, I trace it back to the saying that there is no fruit from conversation. Or basically, don't talk too much. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I would get that a lot too, that secretive point that you brought up where I remember, especially like in dental school, like, like some of my friends, like, like, it'll be like, okay, like, so what are you doing? Oh, like, I'm busy today. I can't come to something. And then I, I'd like leave it at that, right? But then, and there was this one, I remember this one person, like, they would always like, they'd keep going, like, what are you doing? It's like, oh, like, I, I'm going over to my, like, my cousins or whatever. Oh, like, what are you doing there? Like, a bird, like, you know what I mean? Like, they, they just keep going and going. And they're like, in our culture, it's, like, it's kind of like being nosy, right? Like, you're, just, you're like, you shouldn't, like, who okay, cares? It doesn't, it doesn't it, it, like, it shouldn't worry you, right? What, what that person is doing. Like, it's not, it's, it's not the, the main thing is the functionality of the questions for you to attend, attend some more. Can you attend or not? You gave a re reason that you're busy and therefore you cannot attend that, that function that that person asked you to come to. And that should be sufficient, right? But I think in, in here, in like in North American society, it's 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 more common to know what everyone's up to type of thing, especially now like with social media type of thing. I'm, I'm not I'm not too too big in like I don't have Snapchat, Instagram, and that kind of stuff. But uh, you're so mysterious. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But like I think nowadays, like the society is very. I wouldn't even say they're not mysterious. It's it's still picky and choosy in terms of what you release out into the public. If you but saw the conversation that I had with uh, Curtis Yarvin, I've seen him talk about elsewhere that this culture comes from court intrigue. And so from how I understand it, the various castes of society in Ethiopia, there's this ruling class that were the princes. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a ruling class beneath their caste, which are the people who attain princehood, uh, right? So those are the Masafint. Then they're the people, the Maquanant, who attain pr princehood by virtue of military might or whatever favors with a, a local 
uh, prince, you know, that, that, or the king that they got. And then below them, you have the priests. And so the clergy and all the royalty, they had this court intrigue. And I think from them, this culture kind of flowed. So I think cultures that, that have that, have that closer. So even in the United States, you could tell me about Canada, but even in the United States, you see different amounts of this. When I was living in the Midwest and when I've visited the South and, and I've met a lot of people who are Southerners, I would say that the South and the, the Midwest in the United States actually retains some form, if not as deep as you know the ancient society of Ethiopia, they retain some form of this court intrigue. Whereas the cosmopolitan cities in the United States, like the West Coast, Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, not so much. East Coast, DC, New York, it's almost like the more north you go to a point, it gets less and less. Like Boston and New Yorkers are considered the most loudmouth, straightforward. They cuss, they have no manners. There's no intrigue, you know, they're open books. So even within the United States, there's there's differences within regions. I don't know if Canada's known as if I don't know if there's a British Columbia, Ottawa, Fort McMurray, London difference that or Toronto difference that you could talk about. Uh, not much. But, not, I know much, not, not so much that I can say. Like not, I've never, I've never noticed like a big difference. Like, I, but I haven't been to enough places to to have noticed. But for the places that I've been. Just the fact that like Toronto, Ottawa, London, the um, places in Ontario that are frequented the most are so close to each other type of thing. They're all in the same province or the same state um, from an American perspective. So they more or less have the same type of um, culture, I would say. And then the place I'm here now in Fort McMurray, it's, it's, it's far away from there, but there is like the city I'm in now, there is no like, there's no um, kind of long term Fort McMurray and like someone that's been here for like 50 years, their family has been there. It hasn't, it just hasn't had enough time to, um, to kind of develop its own thing. So everyone here is from somewhere else. Literally, yeah, I visited Winnipeg a couple times, so I didn't get to really learn about their culture. It'd be interesting if Manitoba was different or Saskatchewan. Yeah, there you might you might see a bit more just because it's like it's more like it's farmland, so people, I'm sure the farms have passed generation and generation type of thing. So you might be able to see it there, but here definitely not. Everyone like whenever you meet someone here, it's always like, oh, where are you from? And it's like, oh, I'm from Ottawa, I'm from Newfoundland, I'm from somewhere else. So that makes sense. Hit us hit us with the next one. Okay, uh, which, uh, um, which it means. Um, Tatwo means after after washing or bathing or cleansing, um, your mud again, chika. So you're clean and then you get dirty right away. So this kind of alludes to a person. Um, let's say let's say like addiction might be one 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 way we can kind of look at this one where someone's addicted to whatever drug and they go into some rehab center and they get clean and then. They get out of the rehab, and a week or two later, they're back in the same type of situation. Um, you can literally apply this to like endless anyone that just keeps kind of has a habit, and they're trying to stop their habit, and then they find themselves in that situation or that habit um, again. Um, I'm sure every single person has kind of seen themselves or has been in this situation, uh, including myself. So, <laughs> do you want to read something to it? Yeah, it just um, you hear a lot of. Uh, these days, especially in the political circles that I move around, black pilling and white pilling, black pilling being despondency, being pessimism, white pilling mean giving hope, getting people to be more optimistic. And so the question, you know, I, I ask is like, again, is it descriptive or normative? It sounds descriptive. It's just describing that people enter into these cycles. The question is, is it like a depressing statement? Like that's just how people are? Or is there hope that if you hear this statement that people can change? And I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm asking the question. I, 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 I say it's both. I was leaning towards more that's the way people are. Just the, just the fact that it's ubiquitous, like this type of thing. So it's going to happen. But 
it doesn't mean it's going to happen forever. You can be like uh, the awareness itself that knowing that this is this can happen and this will happen might lead you to like more actively be aware of your situation and actively try to prevent it from happening. That's so, good. Yeah. So that's more hopeful. That's more hopeful. Exactly. That there yeah. that there's room for growth and change. Like you're not stuck in if you've ever seen Tom Hanks or is it Bill Murray in I think it's Bill Murray in uh, Groundhog Day where you're just stuck in the same dream living out the same day every day. Like you're not always getting clean and then going into mud. Like maybe you get clean and you stay clean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's 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 fact. You're gonna see it, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna happen every single day to every single person or every. You know what I mean? At some yeah. point, you can break the chain. I'll throw a quick one to you. This one I don't think is that profound, but I think it's great that we have some of these we expand upon in great length, and some where we just go through quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even if you encounter a big potato, it could be lifted with a fork. And that might be a local one. I don't know if that was just my dad saying that to me whenever I would flex my guns. But uh, the idea is that technique is greater than strength. So I mentioned technique and strength earlier when we were talking about tactics. But strength is good, and strength and technique would beat technique. But if all you have is strength and no technique, technique is going to beat strength. Leverage. David and Goliath. <laughs> that's right yeah that's technique plus god <laughs> <laughs> plus prophecy <laughs> but yeah you're right you're right no, that's a good one um the one I, the one that i was gonna say before you mentioned that one was um which literally translates to when you can't find a good or a straight um there's a there's an implicit unmentioned object or whatever or person. Um, you 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 recruit uh, um, a hunched person like a hunch a hunchback um, or something that is not straight bent. Um, and essentially, this kind of points to how like when humans when we, we we can't always be looking for ideal situations or ideal methods to solving our problems um or there's there's nothing there's no nothing that's perfect um and when we can't find or or at least at least when we can't find that which is perfect or that which is ideal we we, we settle for something that is less than that um and like i said you can apply this into various aspects of life but when you can't find that thing that's perfect or ideal, you you settle for something less. You know what I'm Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yep. Yeah. That's a, okay. That's a good one. Yeah. I think I think they match pretty closely. Yeah, they match pretty close. That's good. Uh, All right, I got I got one for you. It's, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying with the normal and the descriptive. So, is the is the descriptive and then the one you mentioned is, is telling you what to do, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's normative. Yeah. And, and I think, I think the greater character of the, if the Amharic aphorisms are more descriptive, but some of them are normative mm -hmm. and maybe the, the American ones tend to be more normative. Yeah. When there were too many women, the guam men or the collard greens got bad or they spoiled. <laughs> I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but I think it's really close to the idea of there are too many cooks in the kitchen, which is like more is not always better. To, to the function of preparing collard greens, to the function of being in the kitchen in general, to the function of anything that you are doing, be conscious of and critically think how many people do I need to do the task? The reason society and civilization exist in the first place is because it's better to have multiple people working together than a lone wolf. The lone wolf uh, is going to die. Actually, it reminds me of uh, another Amharic saying that I'm going to throw in a cheap one here just because it just came to my head. He who eats alone dies alone. 
it's like, okay, you'll be able to eat alone once, but if you keep pushing this thing, you're going to need somebody's help. No one person can do everything. I read a book called Human Action. It's a huge economic tome by the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. And in it, he talks about this kind of reason for civilization forming. And he says, even if you have one person who can do two tasks better than another person, it's more efficient to have that one person do task A and have the second person do task B because of time, because time is limited and resources are scarce. You know, your own output is going to go down over time and so many other factors. So I think it just means like, think about the value of having more people involved on a project, whatever your project is, but be careful not just to add numbers, just to have numbers. Yeah, so quality over quantity might be another way. Yes. It's kind of along, along those lines there where you got to be really careful um, about not having too much, but having something that's, that's worthy to be there, that's qualified, you know? Um, I'll just jump to the next one. Please. Um, which means she has nothing to to ferment, um, but she's <laughs> she's looking for something to to kind of cook. It, 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 this one's very like for all of you that have like, seen your moms or ever making jaw, you'll understand it. So it's difficult to translate. Um, you, for the process of making jara, first you take the flour and mix it with water and put a little bit of like yeast in there and then you like mix it and then you leave it, right? In the boca for it to ferment. And then after a few days or so, that's when you start like cooking the, the injara. So this woman here is, doesn't have anything to, to mix and prepare the dough which will ferment, but she's thinking or she's wishing um for something that to, to cook um so so to me this this essentially points to not knowing kind of what should pre precede and then what should come about or come second kind of not knowing the priority um of things um wishing for let's say it's a, it's a really good life lesson like let's say some people are really bad at prioritizing. So you'll see that they don't have a place to live or a house or something, but you'll see them blow like 5K or 10K or something on some crazy lavish trip or blow 80K, 90K on like a big truck or something, some like latest thing. But then there, there are things that, that, that kind of should pr proceed or precede that, that expense there. Um, so like, for, for me, like I've seen, I've seen it, I've seen, I've seen this thing kind of applied in situations, in situations like that. And then I've also seen it applied in situations where like in an educational sense, where someone like not, not done high school, but they're, they're, they're dreaming and they're, they're like thinking about, Oh wait, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I want to be a doctor. I want to be, um, a lawyer or an engineer or something, but they haven't done, they haven't learned English yet. Like they just came to this country, they haven't learned English yet. They're not willing to put in the work to learn English, but they're thinking, they're, they're hoping and praying that they're going to become like an engineer out of the blue or something like that. You know what I mean? So what are your priorities? What should you do first? What should you do second? What should you do third? I, that's one, that's one way in which I've seen it applied. You? Uh, one second. So, I just thought of like three Americanisms that are related to this. My first thought when you when you said it was window shopping. It just sounds like the the woman being described, and again, it's a descriptive one. She's window shopping. That's what it sounds like. Then I started thinking of what Americanisms are similar. Don't put the cart before the horse, or I think it's the person put the cart before the horse. Another one I thought of is don't count your chickens before they hatch. Another one I thought of is that the journey of a thousand steps begins with the first step. Okay. And I think they all encapsulate this idea of like, there is an order of operations. We learn that in mathematics for a reason. 
because that order is going to facilitate us learning the arithmetic or the mathematics in a in an easier way. And so again, it's not to say that person with a high school degree, it's impossible for them to get a master's degree. I've met people who've done that without getting their bachelor's. It's certainly possible, but it's not the route for most people. And here I think these sayings are for the averages. They're not for the the exceptions well, to the rule. For the, for the, yeah, exactly. I got one for you. We've been doing this all day. I said this in a church in uh, in Dallas, Texas, and his beatitude, Abu Nasawiros, he, he laughed, but he's like, later he hit me up and he's like, I'm going to add this for you, okay? And he says, I want you to add mazmur bahale. So mazmur bahale, nagarba misale, tajbabirle. So that's unique to Abu Nasawiros, so shout out to him. Um, mazmur bahale is all spiritual songs or hymns according to the good is right, begin by saying hallelujah or hallelujah. Uh, the, the original saying, nagarba misale, is that you speak on matters. You talk about things or the thing in this case with misale, with illustrations, with cinematic language. And you drink taj, Ethiopian honey wine, moonshine honey wine, with a birle, which is a special type of cup that is meant to to drink the moonshine honey wine of Ethiopia. Yeah, that's, that's when I've seen, um, like, it kind of like goes back to like, let's say even like scripturally where like Christ is always teaching in parables. Yes. Examples to under, so people can understand things or even in school, like it's always like, give, like whether it's math or something, give a real world problem or real world application or where you're kind of, using an illustration to kind of teach the fundamental principle. Um, so it's, it's kind of a method, a pedagogical tool, right? Yeah. One of the funniest things, brother Johannes told me this a few years ago, you were celebrating, I think Tensai Easter with some Eritreans. And I think you told him, I don't know if it was a preacher, one of them, they were speaking in Tigrinya and you're zoning out cause you don't know Tigrinya. But at one point, he said, Amaratini yeah. Sitaret. This February, I was celebrating Kidana Mirret at an Eritrean church in San Diego. And again, I, I was trying my best to understand. I, I don't know Tigrinya either, but I'm picking up a little bit here and there. And I'm listening to this guy preaching in a house after. Like, this is the Mazambaran just keeps singing all day. So we've eaten at somebody's house and he's talking. And in the middle of his speaking, he said, Amaratini Sitarit. He said the same thing. And so these Amharic speakers are well known even in Eritrea for having these parables that you talk about and speaking in parables. It's very mm. interesting. Yeah. Um, I'll jump to the next one here. I think Jasim Matayani and Aksan. When your nose is hit, your, your, your eyes water or cry. Um, so the, the 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 part of the body that received the punishment is not the part of the body that reacts to the punishment or the injury um, that happened. So to me, this points to the interconnectivity of different parts of our, or it uses the interconnectivity of different parts of our body, how they're all connected. Um, and then you can apply it to different real world situations where we're all dependent on each other. So when one, one thing happens to, to someone or something, there's kind of a spillover effect and damage is done to something else. Alternatively, um, you can kind of apply it in a, in like a cynical sense to someone, like if someone, um, advocates um, for someone that they believe is kind of being unjustly treated or whatever. Um, I've seen, I've seen people kind of use this as well, where they say, ah, I think Jesse met Taina and Exa. It's like, he's, he's the one, it's his issue. It's not your issue. This is the person that's being, so let him stand up for himself. Why are you coming in and um, kind of trying to stand up for him? Let him stand on his two feet type of thing. Um, so I've seen it kind of brought up in, the, in those two ways. 
That's interesting. So those are, I think, again, talk about what you bring to the table. I think if you bring to the table Christianity, you have to see the body of Christ here. In the body of Christ, Christ is the head and everyone else is a body part. And so if one member or one ligament is in pain, the other one is in pain and you got to respond likely. If you don't bring Christianity to the table, that's not your worldview. And then so you'll say, you know, who cares? Who cares about the eyes crying? The nose got hit. Why do you care about the why do you care about the nose when you're the eye? So what do you bring to the table when you hear these parables? And obviously, in the Amharic speaking parable, although there are Amharic speaking peoples of different religions, let's get serious here. Historically, we're talking about a phrase that Taddesa Ta'amarat uses a lot in his book Church and State in Ethiopia, the Christian Kingdom, that is roughly from the 300s to 1975. But right. really from 1270 to 1975 mm -hmm. for the Amharic. And it, it kind of, kind of like hitting at the same thing, but in a different, another tarot, I've heard, um, and I'm just throwing this one in there. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't um, write this one down, but um, you wouldn't cut away, cut and cast away your finger just because it smells bad. Or it's undesirable, or something, because it's 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 still beneficial in some way, um, or it's part of you. It's part of the member. So like it, it, you will you will inflict more damage, um, right? So the the aspect that let's say the finger the finger is the one that's smelling, but the other hand still has an in, is invested in the in the in the health of the finger on the other hand, right? Even though it's not it's not. It's not on the, on the same hand. The other hand isn't going to go and cut that finger because when that finger is cut, it's, it's damaged to this hand as well, like the whole body, right? Um, so kind of along that Christian, Christian sense that you were saying there. Um, yeah, you're an individual, but you're also a part of community. As soon as you get rich, you build a gate, but you also have the duty to be hospitable to the poor who are at your gate. It's very interesting. It's yeah. very interesting. Is propertarian in a sense, and <laughs> and yet still, while being propertarian, demands that you are not the ultimate owner of your property. There's someone above you. There's God who owns all property, and so you always got to have a portion for the poor and the needy. Yeah, yeah, I feel that that one's a deep one. We should probably go on it for a bit more, but um, I'll jump to the next one. Uh, go ahead. Giraffe, rasu, garfu, rasu, chohan. Um, a whip. Um, Not to be confused with giraffe, the animal. Giraffe in Amharic means whip. Yeah, a whip. <laughs> um, a whip. A whip does the the whipping, right? It's the one that that whips the other object. But then the whip also makes the sound um, of the the whipping sound there. So giraffe uh, also goes for also johal. Is I've the, the way I've seen it used. A majority of the time is in a sense of like kind of the boy who cries wolf type of thing where not even necessarily that but like the it's 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 um it's like a form of deception where the person who's actually inflicting the damage or causing the suffering or whatever to happen is the one that's crying saying that Oh, I'm the one that's being, uh, like, whether it's abused. Um, so, like, I don't know, like, do you have anything to add to that one? When I was in mediation, I'm going back again, we had middle school mediation. So <laughs> kids would get in food fights with one another, and we're trying to resolve. They can't sign contracts legally but you could get them to talk to each other, sit at the table when they're usually rolling their eyes and leaning back in the chair, slumping and all these silly things to try to non-verbally say that they're not involved. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? There you are, now you're here. Yeah. Sorry, I keep getting phone calls. In the middle. You're a famous person. You could go do not disturb. So. What do I do? I gotta do that. <laughs> so 
another, so what you do with these children is you get them to tell the story, right? But whenever they tell the story, he did this and then she did that and then he did this, you say to them, try to retell the story, give an account using only I statements, only saying I did this. And so what you're doing is inherently trying to get some accountability, I think, on behalf of the person. So I actually hadn't heard this saying that you said, but uh, I, I, I chuckle at almost all of these because they're all pretty funny. And what I think of is, you know, what role does that person have in the situation as it unfolded? Mm -hmm. I'll hit yeah. you with one. Lijla and Natwa. It's a rhetorical question. Can a child, but in this case, we could probably guess that it's a daughter. Can a daughter teach her mom about the suffering of childbirth? And the obvious answer is no, because the mom is the one who gave birth to you. So this uh, actually, you know, my dad would say this to me too. So it's funny, you know, it's kind of, uh, it gets genderless or gender neutral. But I think the main idea is like, I, I related to, so I'm going to sneak in another biblical one. A prophet is not honored in his hometown. If you've wiped the rear end of somebody, if you've cleaned their nose, their nift, right? their boogers, if you clean their boogers for them, you can't treat them as an adult. You're always going to infantilize them. You, you see this um, in the United States. We've seen someone move from the position of deacon all the way to bishop. I've seen other cases of people who've moved from members of the choir to the priesthood. And when you see that, it's hard for people to use their new titles. It's hard for people to give them the due respect in the, even within the function you were talking about, you know, in the dental office is the only place where you call me doctor. Don't call it to me when I'm on the philosophy of art and science, but even in the setting of the sanctuary, I've seen people struggle to say, bishop so-and-so, priest so-and-so, because they knew them not only with their names, but with with pet names, that they had a sense of familiarity so that it seems that they're almost pushing them away and becoming unfamiliar when they're giving them the kind of uh, due respect that they got. And so the parent often looks at the child and says, look, you could have a PhD for all I care. You're not telling me nothing. You're not teaching me. Like in our culture, like know the difference between child and parent. The, I don't know if you ever heard this one growing up or what feelings you have about it. Yeah, no, I've, I've always heard this one where anytime that I try to like, and you know, sometimes like us, like I don't know, I want to say us, but like me, and like sometimes it's not always like, I actually, I actually meant it, but like sometimes I'm just, I'm just joking because I know it gets on their nerves at some point I, and I keep doing it where I'll go and I know like I have a Western education, like with like, grade one grade two. and there's a certain point up to which i feel maybe grade three grade four or so um not that they never knew it it's just after a certain while you forget what you've learned right um where my parents were unable i guess to have, after a certain point to like help me with homework or whatever and then at that point as a kid i guess maybe it gets to your ego or something it's like oh i know more than you or like type of thing um and then sometimes you'll like you'll cross the line and you'll try and say, you'll say something where it's like obvious they know it they know what it is and, and they'll always bring this up like boy like i've lived i've lived down this world for like 40 50 like you know what i mean like you're not the one that you just came yesterday like you're not gonna <laughs> teach me type of thing another way i've heard it said is another like uh, that was the second one that was the one i had next you got it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, to say translate that one. Yeah, so like a, like a kid can run, but he'll never overrun his father or overtake his father to, to get into first place. Like the father will always be the father. He will always be older than the son, and he will always know more than the son. Um, and it's kind of as along the same same along the, along the same lines where um, me being critical of the same. In a general sense, I could, I could see it being right, but there are going to be avenues where you will overtake the the elder, right? Whether, let's say, for me, it's dentistry. Like, 
my mom or my dad might not know a lot about dentistry, but I, like in that very specialized, narrow sense, like I have a lot more knowledge than them. Um, but in a, just in a general, like common knowledge, life experience um, type of way, obviously, not obviously, but I, I feel they, 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 the saying is right in that sense. There's value to their, yeah. what Merit people call life experience. Yeah. There's merit to the statement in, in that sense, but you can always find a special, like a niche or an avenue or so where you'll be kind of like a really high above or head, head and shoulders above that person, even though they're older than you. Right. Yeah. I think this one goes really against the grain of the American saying the student surpasses the master. The epitome of this is spoiler mm -hmm. alert. In the yeah. old uh, 70s Star Wars movies, Darth Vader defeats his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Well, we have that. We have that. And, and, and you say, that's the other thing I was going to bring up maybe all today was like, we have conflicting sayings. Um, where, where I'll give you the one for this. Like, similar to what you just said, where like, so the, the apprentice or the disciple um, is superior to the, the teacher. Because and that makes intuitive sense too, because the, the disciple will inherit all that which the the um, the teacher has passed on to him, right? Ideally, and would, ideally, correct. And then he would be expected to add to the knowledge bank that exists of his own, right? Um, whether it's like let's like take it from a church way, like the the let's let's take Yarev's. Um, books or the kini or whatever like we do um, we inherit all that was p previous to us and then we add to it um, our own work so in that sense I've, I've heard the opposite too and that, and that goes for a lot of these um, like I've heard my grandma always say <laughs> like <"Gum and> batena, <laughs> where she says like greens green collared in health because like woman is not considered like a hot time, like a rich person's food or something. But at least it's better to to not have like tasty, fulfilling food, but at least be healthy, right? Than it is to have something that tastes good, but then not be in health. Something that has a lot of oil and grease and all that kind of stuff. But then you'll hear the exact opposite. And that comes out of the same person's mouth. My grandma used to always say, uh, where she says like, I want like meat and fat. Um, even if it it causes diarrhea later, like it's better to be to, to to eat tasty food and then suffer from the diarrhea later or the ill health later um, than it is to like eat greens and then be healthy. You know what I mean? So a lot of these things, there's like there's a counter to each and every one of them from the exact same society, um, which kind of just points to different applications. Um, and it's not very black and white. It's very nuanced in, where, in, in, the, in the ways in which we apply these things. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. In the manuscript culture of, for example, the New Testament or other Greek writings, the Presbytira Eugenia Constantinou, whose podcast, Search for the Scriptures, I learned a lot from on, on Ancient Faith Radio, and who I had a little bit of an email correspondence with. She's, she's a great woman who responded to me as well, very knowledgeable in our church. And I'm actually reading her commentary on John's revelation right now. She talks about how one of the things we realize, like what's valuable is what people have preserved. So for example, almost more than any other text, the sermons of John Chrysostom were written down by stenographers, people who write these things down, uh, like in a court and they were preserved as, as written documents. Pope Shenouda, who passed not too long ago, had a lot of his sermons written down and compiled into books. I read his, his book on repentance and his book on comparative theology, which really, again, were his sermons that he was giving in Arabic. So people wrote them down from Arabic, took the time to translate them into English. And I think that culture of preservation points to something. Now, I don't always just believe in what's popular because... Sometimes what's popular isn't necessarily, um, you know, right? There's another funny saying. Again, I didn't write it down, but we're just we're just throwing sayings at people. <laughs> what one idiot has planted, a thousand people will not unroot. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that that's true too. So I think it's good to have pushback and tensions. And again, like you said, be contextual 
in the way in which we uh, apply some of these. So I have a funny one. A couple of these uh, are racist. So I've, I've got one of the, the racist ones here that I heard before from one of my uncles. What's funny is Johannes and I have some, some heritage from Shoah and from Gwander, which is now all in the blob considered the Amhara region. So it acts as if the Amhara region is one entity and one blob. Yet I translated a, a saying, uh, a letter from uh, Az Aminilik, from Emperor Minilik, who is part Shoan, but people think of him, you know, as a full Shoan. He's part Shoan, and he's writing to Abba Jafar, who is an Oromo in Jimma, and he's saying to him, "You need to stop enslaving these people of Janjiro, which themselves are a different kind of uh, a tribe that participate in human sacrifice and." And, and other things that, again, they don't have these Christian values. They have their own values of the time. They're likely pagan values, which are very different from Christian values. And he was saying, look, stop enslaving these Janjiro people because look at me. All these Gondereans are in my court and they're getting along with me, a Shoan. So if Shoans and Gondereans could get along, why can't the Oromo of Jimma and the people of Janjiro get along? He's kind of giving them as an example to show how different. And yet today, since 1991, people have said and try to act as if Shoah and Gondar are exactly the same. So I had a Shoan uncle one time poking fun at a Gondarean uh, family member. And he said, Shoama Shoano, Gondargen Ababano. And, and what's funny is he was being mocking and he's not from that place. So Shoama Shoano means this region known as Shoah formerly is just Shoa. It's normal. It's common. But Gwander, this region known as Gwander, which I theorize that uh, Tolkien probably copied to, to get his city of Gondor in Lord of the Rings, because he also has a city, Roha, which is uh, the kingdom in Lasta and Werlo. Uh, I think he, he looked at Ethiopia a little bit when he wrote his Lord of the Rings series, but that's a side note. So he says, Gwander gen Ababano. Gwander is a flower. So Shoa is normal, it's common, but Gondar is a flower. So he's from Shoa, but he's mocking a Gondarean saying like, this is your mentality. You think we Shoans are common people. You think we're just regular people, but, and you think you guys are the, the great flowers. You think y'all are pretty and special and different. And what's funny is that the fact that this saying exists just shows you the diversity of, again, this region known as the Amhara region. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard that one or any takes you have on that. No, I've never heard. Actually, that's, you're, you're the first one that brought that one up to me. Shoagin, Shoagin, Shoano? Shoama, Shoama, Shoano. Gundergan Ababana. Yeah, it's the first time I heard that one. But I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not oblivious to the, uh, to the, the general stereotypes that people, people from Gunder think they all that. And <laughs> <laughs> everyone else. I'm not, I'm not oblivious to that. So it makes sense, but I've, I've never actually heard it before. This is the first time that I heard it. I got one more racist one for you, but you could cleanse our palate with a, with a non-racist one. Before you come, come in with it? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I don't So um, my hand, I got bitten in, on the hand. Um while trying to, or while feeding. Um, so it goes back to gursha, gursha being like a, 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 like a, a like food that you give um, using your hand to someone and you kind of put it in their mouth. And, and so you kind of, your what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very intimate act. Like the American thing would be just to kind of give somebody a plate of food or something. But this is actually, like you said, you're sticking your fingers in someone's mouth. Your fingers and someone else. So it's a very vulnerable um, position, right? For your hand. It kind of goes back to the, I think when the Japanese kind of, and we do it too, I guess. Um, when they, when they give salamta, when they, when they say hello, when they greet people, they bow their necks. And I've always read somewhere where it's like, it's they're, they're exposing their most vulnerable portion of their body, which is the neck. Um, at which point the person that they're greeting can easily slice their head off with the, the sword or whatever that they carry. Um, so in a similar way, like putting your fingers in someone's mouth is a vulnerable position for your fingers. Um, 
However, you're doing it for the benefit of that person, right? You're trying to, you're feeding them, essentially. You're giving them nourishment. Um, so even though you're doing this good deed, you, your fingers got bit, bit off. Um, and then another, another, another a second, I'm going to, before I kind of like unpack it, a second one I'm going to talk about that kind of goes with this one. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, means like kind of to obtain righteousness in order to obtain righteousness, um, or favor, um, I carried her and carried her like literally lifted someone and kind of uh, piggybacked them uh, in order to obtain favor or righteousness. Uh, like she wouldn't get off. She's like, I took her to the destination. Like you're supposed to carry them, take them to the destination and they get off. But like she never ended up getting off. So I got stuck carrying her like kind of forever type of thing. Um, so it kind of, and now when I'm unpacking it, it kind of goes back to the point where you're doing a good deed. However, your good deed puts you in a precarious situation or ends up putting you in a precarious situation and one that you do not desire. Um, whether it's carrying someone forever, like you, you want to help someone out for a bit, a certain amount of time, and then hopefully they, they kind of get up on their own two feet and they're good to go, but then they just keep hanging around, hanging around, hanging around, and then you're tired of like keep supporting that person or whatever it is. And then um same with this one uh like i'm doing something good i should receive whether it's payment gratitude anything like that for that action in return um and damage is being inflicted on me um so it's just it's kind of like a warning to me like the concepts in which i've heard it is always in, in a sense of a warning where um where I'm about to do something or whatever, and then my mom or my whatever it is, anyone that says, like, oh, like, don't extend yourself out too much because you might end up in a, like, a, not in a good situation um, if that person doesn't have your best interests in mind, if they're just trying to use you or something, right? You want to go ahead on that one? It reminds me, again, this is just the theme of the night, is your mom or whoever saying this to you, is trying to be normative. They're trying to tell you what to do. They're trying to give you an instruction, but it's through a descriptive statement. The way I know this in English is don't bite the hand that feeds you. And again, that's very explicit. It's very straightforward. It's very commanding. Whereas this one, it's like, it's providing you the situation. It's saying people in these situations get their fingers bit when they're giving someone a bite to eat. And, and I like that, which also, you know, might be close to don't bite off more than you can chew. Like give, but know, know your limits. And, it, and, and it's funny because it's, again, it's a Christian culture, but some of these things might have tensions with the Bible because Peter tries to get away with this and finessing the Lord Jesus and he says, Lord, how many times should I forgive? And he gives some number. I think it's like nine times. And, uh, and, and he's like, no, seven times 77, which is like, okay, then do I need to do the arithmetic? Seven times seven is nine, carry the four. Okay. And I need to do it like 500 times or something. No, 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 no. It means there's no limit. Like you just keep giving till you have nothing left and until he comes again. But maybe the more practical Ethiopian has this like feels this duty to give but is trying to put some limit some earthly limitation to the giving it's like all right like the jesus got this standard or whatever but like you gotta live you gotta you gotta get by so like there's gotta be some limit yeah well that's that's a good uh it's a good it's a good addition to that one for sure there's there's always a tension between i read um before you passed donald levine one of his books, I think it was called Five Decades in Ethiopia or something along those lines. I think he was he lived in months. Yeah. And in his book, he always thought he talked about the dichotomy of Ethiopia in the sense of the the religious, like we never lose that religious ideal. And it's and the the, the outward expression of it is found in the in the priests and the deacons and the church um clergy type of thing who 
what their remain celibate till they're whatever and all all that they, they basically do everything according to what needs to be done and if not they're cut off from that from that group um and then on the other side you have just the commoner who isn't required to keep all the fasts or like what like you know they're required by the books but like in practicality it's it's rarely rarely type of practice so there's there's a there's like one side of like perfect ideal situation and then there's like the part where they realize the limitations of humans um or not necessarily humans but of humans that aren't as learned as they are or don't have the same type of reasons to follow um uh the rules as strictly as those who are in the clergy do um and then there's like this whole second tier of like instruction of the same of the same thing so in, in this sense like you said like an earthly um interpretation of this the scriptural truth um does provide limitations and i think and i think what he was trying to get is that our society understands that this is the ideal but we also understand the human condition in which the majority of people will not will not reach that ideal type of thing yeah i got i got another racist one for you and i think this is one where you you have heard a different version so the way in which i heard this again uh one northern showing relative is saying this to a southern gondarean in southern gondar you have touch gaint is one of those areas near debra tabur Amuragadel, Nafas Mocha, places like that. And so Gaint is a place in southern Gwandar. And what I heard her say, which made me get into tears of, of just laughing is so ridiculous. And again, she's married to somebody who is, you know, of this. So, you know, it's racist, but it's like it's also in 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 slight jest and people poke fun at each other. She said, Ka'arba uh, Agan ka ka and gaint arba aganent. So she said, rather than dealing with one person from gaint, I'd rather deal with 40 devils or with 40 demons. And, you know, I don't know exactly what that means. How I heard it and how I interpreted it is uh, these folks from gaint must be great businessmen and merchants. That's what I think. That's the, my best guess is like, they must be real tough hagglers in the marketplace so that they got this sort of reputation for being uh, tough people. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, you know what exactly that all means. So yeah. go I ahead and uh, jump I in. Yeah, I heard it the other way where it was, like you mentioned at the top where, and, and the numbers are different too. You've heard it with 40, I heard it with 50. Kahamsa uh, ganint andigaint, where... It's instead of 50 demons, one gaint. So what um, would that mean to you? So the way the way in which it was it was I, I heard it used was a method to um kind of describe the level of ferocious like ferociousness or ferocity <laughs> um that gainte people have. Um whether it's in war, um, I, I, I didn't hear it in a business context. Uh, um, okay, so so it actually retains the same meaning then. Yeah, yeah, so the, the, meaning, the meaning is the gaint, like you'd rather deal with the demons or the devils, like a battalion of devils or demons than with one person less, from gaint. Are less, harmful, are less harmful to you than one gaint. Like and I, and, I, and I would I would I would assume potential harm. Like not they're not they're not just out of the way like out of the blue just kind of like you know what I mean doing anything bad to anyone. But like if there's a reason for them to be angry for, about something or whatever, they will like inflict damage on you. Worse than 50, 50 devils can type of thing. I mean, it's hilarious. The first time, it's, it was actually my grandma who said that to one of my uncles. And it was just like, this is my uncle living at her house. And she just, out of the blue one day, she said it to him. And I was just like, I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it just, yeah, uh, the most recent time I heard it was when I was in Ethiopia in 2016 at my grandma's in Addis Ababa. 
And my gra- the maid at my grandma's house is from Gaint. She's from Nafas Mocha. And she, when, whenever she made Buna, like Buna Satafala, she would grab the kasal, the, the coal that was burning hot with her hand. And she wouldn't feel the heat. Like, like it wouldn't, like she says, she feels the warmth, but it's not like really hot. So she wouldn't use like a, um, a tong or whatever. Like she would literally grab it. And then my uncle brought it. He's like, you know what? You know what they say? Huh? I'm like, what? He's like, Kahamsa Agant and Gaint. And he's like, these people are like, they're strong. They can like withstand like different, like in a good sense, I guess he's, he brought it up and not, not at that time. But um, that's the latest that I heard. I can remember like the situation in which I heard that one come up. That's so funny. Yeah. Go ahead. Hit us with another one. We'll cleanse the palate again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when uh, it when a person like slanders someone else, listen to that slander as if you're the one that's being slandered. Um, and I guess this kind of points to the habitual um nature of the the concept of slander itself how habitual it is and it does not know friends from enemies um and anyone can be an enemy at any time just because you're a friend today does not mean that tomorrow you won't be the one slandered as well um and i've heard it in in a sense of like be careful or not even just be careful like don't be around people that kind of engage in this type of behavior because the end and the end like don't give and don't give me the excuse that like oh but they're nice to me type of thing where like oh they're not slandering me they're just saying it about someone else it's like well if they're doing it to someone else now then tomorrow something happens the exact same thing is going to happen to you so it's better for you to kind of avoid someone like this um that's the context in which i heard it have you heard it in any way i have not heard that saying it's it's interesting i don't have anything like crazy sage to say about this particular aphorism. What I could say is going back to some of the themes that we've been drawing on tonight is, uh, again, this talks about how in the, in the Amharic speakers mentality, there are certain traits that are fixed. And so this trait seems fixed. It's not really showing like a growth mentality, like, like, oh, maybe they're talking slanderously about this person, but they wouldn't say that about you. No, no, no. It's saying like, if somebody shows you who they are, trust them. Yeah. I think that's a common saying now on the internet, right? When yeah. when someone tells on themselves, trust them or or something like that. And this one, this one actually kind of leads into the next one that I was going to bring up where like I said, this one always, I've, all the time I hear this one, this it's always in the context of like, watch out. It's like, it's an, it's a piece of advice. Yeah. So this one's normative. Give you advice, advice, advice. And it's like, where the saying says, advise him, advise him, counsel him, counsel him. If he doesn't listen, or if he says no to your counsel, then let the trouble that he will encounter by not listening to your advice, let that instruct him, let that counsel him, let that advise him type of thing. Um, so that, that it's, it's literally kind of explains like the like I said, the, the way in which this saying was, I've heard so many times, like if you don't, if you don't kind of wise up and listen to the advice of an elder or whatever, that's telling you it's not advisable to be, with a slanderous person then okay it might take a year might take two years might take five years ten years but at some point that person will slander you and then you'll be like ah okay i can't be around people that slander because i'm gonna get caught in their crosshairs at some point in my life anyway so the instruction of someone that has kind of been through that you you kind of you didn't you didn't take that to heart so that person just leaves you and then you you let the situation teach you. Um, you want anything to add to it? Two things. One, the value of repetition in Semitic tongues. So we don't have 
the form of emphases that we have today in the 21st century. So when Semitic tongues or languages were developed, uh, tongue is a way of saying language within Semitic tongues, we say lisanat, the ideas of emphasis happen through repetition. So it's not mikaro, it's mikaro mikaro. It's not lem, it's lem lem. It's not duk, it's duk duk. It's not liyu, it's liyu liyu. Liyu liyu, special special, duk duk, super dark, super dark. Um, what is the, the one who's mikaro mikaro? It's not just advise him, it's advise him, advise him. So it's twice. And the repetition is there because when you tell this person more than once, when the makara, when the suffering or the troubles reaches them and becomes their instructor, hopefully they'll remember the words that you delivered to them through repetition. And in that moment, you will be vindicated because you didn't just tell them once. You used repetition. And then the second thing is I heard the saying slightly differently. So, you know, some of these sayings we hear differently, or maybe I'm remembering it differently, but I remember it with ala balazia. And ala balazia is one of the funniest, like ala balazia makarayim karo. It's one of the funniest words, I think, in the Amharic language. I'm convinced it's some sort of contraction of a few other words that I'm not quite sure of. And I found that with a, a lot of words recently. My friend Heywan, who I've had on this program, she let me know that Ato, the title that means Mister, originally was Abeto Hun, be a lord. I've learned, you know, Atabba is Ehut Ababa, or my sister, my flower. Like a lot of these words um, that that people use through time, they get condensed. So I'm sure Alabalazia is one of those, and I don't know what it originally was, but it's one of those words that is like worst case scenario. That's how I translate it or understand it. So advise them, advise them. Worst case scenario, let the bad situation advise them. Yeah. Other, otherwise is another way I translate that one. Otherwise, let the situation, you know what I mean? I, I'm with you. My uncle made this good point, though, about this word. He said, I have never heard somebody say, and then a good point happened. When you said otherwise, I feel like you can say maybe a, a good option is available. But Alabrezia, I've never heard a good option coming after that. Yeah, uh, I can see what you mean. I, I have, like, and in terms of just an option, like, like you're 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 getting someone to choose between two, three different options. Like, do this, Alabrezia, hey Nadrik, hey Kaluna, demo, hey Nadrik. So I think that might be a usage thing generationally. My um, one of my great aunts, she was my paternal grandfather's cousin. Uh, God rest her soul. She's been gone for a while. She <laughs> she heard me say kauti one time, and she said kauti manu kauti amatau. And <laughs> in Addis Ababa, in this in the kind of Addis Ababa Arada slang of the day, kaut or kaus, it means wild. But a wild thing is a good thing because you're trying to turn up. You're trying to have a party. For her and her generation, something wild is something chaotic. It means chaos. It's pandemonium. It's a brouhaha. It's something bad. So she heard me say wild and she's like, no. I remember another time I used the word ma'at to say I have, you know, uh, I don't know. Ma'at mas talun. So try to say I have a lot of books. And she said, no, 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 no. Don't say ma'at. Ma'at means many. But for her, it specifically means many evil things. So in the church, you know, we say yadina ma'at. May he save us from many things, but many what things? Neutral things? No, evil things, a swarm, a locust. And it has this idea that when you go beyond moderation, it's not a good thing. Um, so people usually say bizu to say a positive thing to say a lot or many and ma'at for evil things. But even my parents disagreed with my great aunt. They would use, you know, ma'at in any situation so that when it comes to my, our generation, Really, I don't think people distinguish between the two. Yeah. Yeah, it could be a generational thing for sure. Um, uh, one more thing that I wanted to bring up with that one, though, with, with the, and I tried, I don't know, I kind of did it when I translated it. I think I might have picked it up from you where with these repet repetition words, there you might have two or three different English words that can, that can kind of translate, you can translate. 
the the thought to so mikr being counsel advice yes. um and i tried mikr or mikr was counsel him advise him and i remember when he used to translate these muslim words into english aman ba aman instead of truly 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 verily and um it yeah. kind of brought up I, I did that for the melody by the way yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying <laughs> it 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 um it it brought up the same thing here. Um, Do you think it's good overall? Because I have a different, I have like a, a pedagogy for translation when we're just going to read it. And then I have a pedagogy for translation for the melody. For the melody so for yeah. the melody, for example, I translated Mankira Subhat as mind boggling. Now that's a, that's quite a dynamic translation. It, I think it captures the thought, to be honest. I do think it captures the thought. But if I was being more meticulous of trying to get a direct, exact translation, I would say the glory is marvelous. Or I would say, you know, the glory is splendiferous or amazing or awesome. Mm -hmm. But mind boggling, I think, was a way of like capturing both like that awe, that fear, that sublime. Yeah, so okay. I, I definitely take more liberties when we're singing to make it easier for the melody. They call it what poetic license? Yeah, <laughs> they love to like play around with stuff. But anyway, maybe maybe topic for another video. Um, but I just wanted to mention it because I know we've talked about it before. Um, I'll go to the next one here. He dot bello, in the he dot to go. Um, I like that. Don't tell him to go. Make him go. And um, it just it, it points to sometimes. The, the word, like something that we speak, an order um, or a command is not the best way in which to obtain results or obtain the desired, the desired result um, or that which you wish. Now, we can, we can, like, I've seen it, I've seen this come up, like, in the workplace where... It's, it's used in the sense, like, if you're the boss or a manager, don't just, like, command your workers, like, do this, do this, do this. But, like, give them some type of incentive to make them want to, right? To, to, to put that desire to want to serve um, in their mind. And then that you'll be more effective in, in obtaining your outcome if you kind of use, use that method as opposed to just being all raw, raw and using your voice to... Which, which might work short term or so, but long term um, for everyone's happiness, for everyone's sanity's sake, it's not the greatest thing to do. You know what I mean? Uh, Antoine de saint Exupéry has this, uh, I had to throw some French in because my friend is from French Canada. Uh, he has this great saying, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, Teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Mm -hmm. I think another one, an Americanism is actions speak louder than words as well. Yep. It's close enough, right? It's like, yep. I have learned this too. And it's so hard for me. But again, I think the West emphasizes this blank slate too much. And the younger I was, I think the more I was assimilatory. And especially in the past nine, 10 years, I've actually become more Ethiopian and it's actually been the time that I've been away. Last time I was in Ethiopia was 2011. So in the time that I've, I've been away from it, I've longed for it the most. So I've created my own Ethiopian subculture within the United States and I've learned my Amharic more, all the things I know about Guz I've learned in the past nine, 10 years. And so, um, there's a way in which you can get somebody to do things, but sometimes you have to be more assertive. And in my old blank slate thought, I used to be super passive because I don't want to infringe. I viewed it as infringing on someone's agency. And even again, to go back to the field of mediation, we have something called transformative mediation, something called facilitative mediation, and something called directive mediation. Directive mediation, there was this 80-year-old retired businessman who worked in the same court as me, and he would sit people down, and he would berate them. 
he would say, what's wrong with you? You need to settle. And he would literally berate people into settlement. And I, I, they, the judge used to call him Babe Ruth and encourage him. And he actually, you know, he was effective at getting written settlements. He actually got people to do it. But it just seemed so brutal to me. It seemed so pushy that I was very timid and didn't want to do that. The facilitative person is more Socratic. They, they use guiding questions to lead people to the answer. And then the transformative person is really almost a fly on the wall interviewer where they're, they're literally almost just a body in the room and they try to speak as little as possible and try to maximize the agency of other people. I have grown, I was probably more transformative and, and, and flirted with being facilitative and in growing older, I realized there are some situations I need to be more directive. I need to have a little bit of a stronger hand, be more assertive. And, and there's an error in that point too. But I think you just need to be able to assess each context and situation. And when you need to lean into that assertiveness and when you need to lean back away from that. A example I could give you is I started a Bible study with my church last November and we've been going six months strong now in the quarantine. And in the beginning of the quarantine, we go for about an hour and a half. We would read a whole chapter of the Bible and I would really push it on the students. But the more and more I realized they saw me as their teacher and rightfully so. So, you know, I had a duty to talk more. So now for the first 30, 40 minutes, I actually introduce the text more in depth. And then we spend the rest of the time asking questions. And, and that way, you know, my kind of preparation and, and role as teacher in that environment takes the forefront more. So I, I'm more directive. And so it's something I'm, I'm personally working on. But yeah, I find this a very useful saying or aphorism. Yeah. I got one for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I've gotten up to 22 just writing in, in the interim. So this is beautiful. Uh, we're going to go for my longest episode yet. I hope, I hope you're not tired. Uh, you used the word gobata earlier, right? We could translate in so many ways. I think you called it uh, hunchback. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think you said hunchback. I think it it's like any sort of deformity or a paralytic. Uh, it could be translated differently. But gobata bit by la andat berkano. So in the house of huh? Gobata. Gobata. Oh, I I missed it. I think yeah. I wrote. I think I wrote uh, "gobata" because I because you said that. You're yeah. right. You're right. So "komata" like a leper. A leper. Yeah. So in the in the house of the leprosy, and the leprosy actually dissolves your your fingers, which is something some people may not know. They might just think of leprosy as a skin disease, but in the "komata no aren't." Yeah. But komata, but thank God you're here. And I always almost confuse komata with komtata, which is bitter. <laughs> so, but komat abet bala andat birkano. In in the house of lepers, the person with one finger is rare. I've heard in English, in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is king. And, that, and so that also exists in Amarga. But oh, really? But urbet andaina ma birkano. Oh, but they don't say nugus no. No birkano, birkano. Yeah. yeah. So I've heard it with komata. That's interesting. I've heard of uh, both. Okay, nice. So I think the point here is that you may not see yourself as talented, but you got to survey your surrounding, right? There might be, I don't want to get carried away and say a million, but let's say there are a thousand or a few thousand people who know better Amharic than Johannes and I. I might even still be generous, but let's, let's, let's grant the situation, okay? He is in Fort McMurray. I'm in Los Angeles. There are not a thousand Fort McMurrayans better than Johannes at Amharic. There are not a thousand Los Angelinos, even amongst the native Los Angelinos, better than Henok. Let's just be honest. And the result of that is the surroundings. So I think it's like just measure things not objectively throughout the universe, throughout the cosmos, but within their context, within their situation, relationally. And then you Relative. can have a judge of things. Is that, a, is that the right word? Relativistic point of view? Yeah. I, I, not the philosophy relativism, which, you know, says mm. there's no truth, but mm. yeah, I would say relational. I would say relational more, but yeah, relativist works too. 
Yeah. I just fear it getting associated with that philosophy, which <laughs> postmodernist. You brought that yeah. up in a, in a recent episode, I think. <laughs> Always, always smashing it. My number one uh, enemy is postmodernism, although there are some things I've learned from it. Uh, But Thomas Finley, who I've learned from greatly, every time he would get on stage and and preach, and he would preach against post, uh, excuse me, secular humanism, which there's a relationship, and I think both lead to, to nihilism. One day he actually got on the stage and he was talking about communism. And I remember one of my students said, that was a throwback. <laughs> He's like, I never heard somebody talk about communism. Yeah, I think I think I heard J, uh, JP, like Jordan Peterson, you brought him up earlier. I think one of his videos, he always brings up, he critiques postmodernism so hard. And he says the end result is nihilism as well, where like nothing matters anymore, like type of thing. And I think if I'm not mistaken, he points to, I want to say Nietzsche. Nietzsche, yeah. Nietzsche, mm-hmm. who, who, was, who had kind of, gone to the same conclusion like a hundred years earlier or something he's for sure a predecessor to the frankfurt school and 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 later the postmoderns yeah he's the guy who originally said if you've heard uh god is dead yeah right and we killed him and and, you know you see these kind of protestants uh, making movies like god is not dead they're responding to nietzsche everybody's responding to nietzsche david bentley hart who's you know famous for trying to spread the uh, uh, apocastasis or that all should be saved right now, which I don't care for and is a heresy, but who's also translated amazingly, not with a committee, but as an individual, the entire New Testament meticulously from the Greek. I have an audio Bible of his, not read by him, but I wish it was read by him. And he's a very learned, very learned man. And he said the same thing. He said, if he was not an Orthodox Christian, he would be a Nietzschean and and thus a nihilist. And, and that is to say that, you know, the kind of in-betweens are not very rigorous intellectually. And so one thing you can't say about Nietzsche is you can't say that his thoughts are not consistent or that he's not an intelligent man or that he doesn't have a beautiful mustache. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I just, I just remembered that, that he, he brought that up when you, when you talked about your, you create, you critiquing postmodernism. Um, but yeah, when I, when I brought up the word relativist, I just meant relative to your, your surround, your immediate surroundings type of thing. That's um, how I view it. Do yeah. you have any other thoughts on, on the saying? Uh, no, I'll just jump to the next one that I have. Please. Satwal um, Dubila. <laughs> eat before you give birth. Um, and it's 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 in the mail it's i guess it's it's it, nowadays it's probably um like intergender like you can use it for both genders it's, it's like super gender um but in, in in the way it's said here it's it's kind of in the male sense and it t- basically telling you to eat before you give birth um and then eat in this sense all the time that i've heard it was i've heard it in two ways number one it's monetarily um make your money before you have a child because once you do have a child, then you will have to spend a lot of your time geared towards the family as opposed to on your profession or whatever it is. Um, and then the other way is actually like a literal translation where it's like Satwal Dubila because, which kind of didn't make sense to me in an Ethiopian context because in an Ethiopian context, back in the day, I think kids always ate the leftovers of their parents, right? And, but in a, in a, yeah, in a North American context, you, you feed your kids first and then you, 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 you eat as a, as a child. So my mom always like, used to always say it when like, she'd be like, like she wouldn't eat, but she would make sure that we're eating, we ate first. And then I'm like, Oh, why aren't you eating? She's like, like you, the saying goes, eat before you give birth because once you give birth you're only worried about your kids and making sure they want to they're fed and stuff as opposed to yourself um so i don't have much to add to this i would say people talk about living their lives vicariously through others i think because of evolution parents do this the most they have their progeny and they basically see because human beings live limited lives that the extension of their life is through the lives of their children. So that many times things that, you know, a parent wasn't able to accomplish in their life, they feel almost the same, if not greater satisfaction 
in seeing the next generation do it. So because of all that, exactly what you said, they're focusing on the concerns of their child and putting them before their own. It's like eating, you know, the Bible says some people make their food into their God. Like <laughs> some people really enjoy food. That's why gluttony is a sin, right? And, mm -hmm. and particularly gluttony when you neglect the poor and the needy. So I think it's just like, you know, be fruitful, be merry, enjoy yourself because you, you only get to be selfish when you're by yourself. Once you have progeny, you can't be selfish. You, you got to just live through, through them. Yeah. That's good. Um, that, or he who a woman has sent does not fear death. Um, this is a funny one kind of thing. <laughs> so like, it got it, it it goes to like like I think of a Beyonce song like Who Runs the World Girls. You heard that one like I love one of her songs and <laughs> how the power of the women or men like being slaves to women in a sense, where as long as it's a woman who has sent them to do something, no matter how dangerous it is, whether it's war or whatever, like. There's no fear in that man. He will go and do it. And it kind of goes back to that. Like, I remember in like grade 10 and stuff when we were learning about Canadian history and the war and everything. Uh, you take a look at some of these posters that the military would put up to recruit young men. Which war is this? World War II? World War II. Yeah, World War II, World War One. I. I think both of them. I don't remember exactly which one, but it's one of the two for sure. Here in Canada, they would they'd put up posters where... You have women who are type kind of like, oh, you're not a man if you don't go fight in the war, or like, <laughs> kind of like um, <laughs> to kind of make the guys feel like, like, okay, we have to go for the sake of, you know what I mean? That type of like to stir up that type of um, that type of uh, feeling in the guy, so that he can go fight, type of thing. And I feel like this this thing kind of encapsulates, or at least that's one way in which I've seen it put into action to a certain end. There are certainly many things that we can point to yeah. how men have abused their power against women, especially in the Ethiopian context over the years. But if we listen to the evolutionary biologists, a lot of human history is explainable by female mate choice and, mm -hmm. mate, and mate selection. And so that process is very intricate and I think that's part of what's going on. Let me throw one at you. You used the number 50 earlier. Hamsa lomi la andesau shekim. La hamsa sao get achono. 50 lemons are burdensome for one person. But for 50 people, it's actually an ornament. I think this is in praise of collaboration. I actually relate it to, I didn't have this written down, but if you get a, um, a web together, you can ensnare, you can even ensnare a lion. Mm -hmm. And I think both of them are praising collaborative work. We talked about how civilization and society relies on people being interconnected and working together and the communal bonds. This is for me, the communal element. Yeah, um, especially with the Diri Bab Rambasas, or like if the, if the if the strings kind of work together, they unite. They they're the, the power, and it goes back to I think go, you brought up a biology, an evolutionary biologist type of view, where we have. I remember back in school where we learned about the the sum being greater than the parts, um, where different. You'll have let's say. Uh, always from a genetic point of view, you have like this gene that uh, where you produce, I don't know, X liters per minute or something at a certain, certain rate. And then you add a second one that does the same rate, but in unison, they can do like triple or quadruple the, the rate. It's not, it's not in that one-to-one -one ratio type of thing. Um, so I, I kind of take it from that perspective. Um, and then, the Hamsa, the Hamsa Lomi also with that one, I get, I get, um, 
kind of vibes of Tumkat. You know, you know, during Tumkat, how uh, guys be throwing lomis at girls <laughs> in Ethiopia to to kind of choose mates or mates. I think. Yeah. I'm not too. I'm not too. Uh, I don't know. You might know a bit more on, about that than me. I'm so I, I, I don't know someone who's ever done it seriously. And this past uh, Tumkat or Theophany, people people actually, uh, one of my friends had like a box of lemons or lime. Lomi could be either lemon or lime. And, and they were selling it. But I, I usually think of it as lime. Uh, I've also heard Batra Lomi. I don't know if that refers to something else. Uh, or Bakura. I don't know if it's Bakura or Batra. Probably Bakura. Uh, and, and they were actually selling them at the Epiphany celebration. It's this great Orthodox Christian holiday where you go outside of the physical church building to remind you that God is universal. He could be present anywhere. And especially the way in which the the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant would move around and the tent of his presence, the, the, the gathering would always be around the tent of his presence. And so we go out a little bit further from our normal place and multiple parishes usually get together to celebrate at the same time it's become a, a very worldly place there's another saying around um, may, may, may this uh, dress that is not worthy of the theophany celebration um break or you know be torn apart it's like it's if your dress ain't worthy of that, then it's not there. So there's a sort of like we said, all these tensions between the culture. And so there's a whole culture of Ethiopians who participate. They could be Protestants. They could they might even be Muslims. They might be atheists. They don't care about theophany, but they're there because the people are there. And there are all these pop up shops that, that people have. And throughout that process, someone will throw a lomi or a lime at a girl. And if she likes you, she'll roll it back to you. If she doesn't like you, she'll leave it there on the floor. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I, 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 you know, I general, I, I had a general idea about what it was, but I think you, you did a better job of explaining it there. Um, but yeah, anyway, in the end, hamsa hamlan so hamsa so get. It goes back, kind of the opposite of what we were talking about earlier, which uh, we're having too many people to do a task is not necessarily always the best thing. But there are certain times where a task is too much for one person and you need to enlist the support and the help of your your friends, your family, whatever, um, colleagues, etc. In order to kind of complete the task or whatever it is um, in an efficient manner. Yeah, if you're, if you're trying to cook in the kitchen, 50 people is way too much. Way too if you want to take too. over a small city state, you might need 50 people. <laughs> exactly. You might need even more than that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the last one, I got one more written down here. Oh, I got a bunch. So you finish off and then I'm going to, okay. I'm going to hit you with a bunch more. Cause I was right. Okay. I was writing as we're talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think our two to one ratio didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't last all the way, but okay. I cheated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Keith Galbo Kanibinib. Uh, this is a funny one. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess Makit Maglev, like to moon someone, or <laughs> the, the, the death, the translation, but like essentially, you don't have um, Kanibinib, Makananib is to a headscarf. So, women, when they come to church, they put a netala over their head, they right? Um, so, Makananib. Is covering your head while Keet Maglev is your essentially your butt cheeks are showing type of thing. Um, so even though when I'm unpacking this, even though going to church, like if a, if a woman goes to church without her head covering, that is well, it used to be like it's an embarrassment. It's not it's not polite, it's not right. Um in our in our church context. Um going around with your butt cheeks showing is even worse right so there's something there there it kind of just goes to earlier we were talking about prioritization with one of the turrets there um and this kind of kind of um circles around the same point where there are things that we need to worry about first and that are more pressing needs that need to be addressed before we start worrying about something else so I've, I've, I've seen this one applied to 
um, just kind of keeping along the theme. It's not necessarily a woman thing, but I've seen it. I've seen it applied a lot when it comes to um, family members or whatever, where there are certain pressing needs that they need, whether it's going to school or um, whatever, housing or like, transportation or whatever it is. And they kind of forego those important needs for um, prioritizing things such as makeup or nail polish or getting their nails done or whatever, stuff like that. And now I'm not judging. I'm not saying that one's more important than the other in terms of their context. But generally speaking, in, in the situations I've heard it spoken is that these things that I listed, like makeup, et cetera, et cetera, are frivolous. They're secondary. Um, there are other things that are more important that should be at attended to first before we start worrying about things like that. So in this situation, this that same thing. You should worry about getting pants that aren't ripped <laughs> so you can cover your butt before you start worrying about wearing a netala on your head type of thing. Go I like that. Here. And I forgot this earlier when you said it, but I just remembered it again now and it's cracking up in my head. One of my first roommates when I was living in downtown Los Angeles, he... Um, <laughs> He was asking me for soap and shampoo, which again, as a man who believes in hospitality, I had no issue with, but I took issue with it because I saw him spending copious amounts of money on getting his blunts and his weed every day. And he had money for these extracurricular activities when the man did not even have soap to wash himself every day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is crazy. I was like, my priorities would, would never be that way. And again, like to your point, it's not that head coverings are wrong. In fact, our culture very much likes mm. head coverings. But it's like, don't even think about head coverings if you're out there mooning people, which is mm. the second thing. Um, there are different Amharics. I talked about this in my in my episode on uh, humor with my friend Haywan. But Gwander, Shoa, Wello, Gwodjam had different Amharics, let alone the other regions where Amharic was less spoken like Tigray and the South and the East and the West, but then even the capital city, Addis Ababa, the other chartered city, Diridawa, they each have their own cultures and kind of the less of the chartered city, the more rural you are. And then also depending on the generation, the word Kit for uh, Buddhist Maximus or whatever you want to say it as is whatever you, is jarring. It's a very yeah. jarring word. Most people I grew up around who grew up in the time of the king in the 50s, 60s, and 70s would never say the word keet unless they were very mad and they were speaking to an infant or like a child. Most of the time, people would say makamacha, which translates to your seat. So the fact that it's even entered into this preserved saying is interesting. And I'm I'm curious to see, you know, uh, where it came from. And I wonder if it ever evolved. I wonder if anyone ever said makamacha, but just the fact of that word usage it's a jarring saying that not not every circle would you be able to even utter this saying, let alone get the the teaching or the value of it, which in a medical se uh, medical setting they call triaging, right? The setting of priority. Yeah. Exactly triaging. I don't. Maybe you guys say it different. No, I I probably butchered it, bro. You're <laughs> you're the medical expert. <laughs> Yeah, we say triaging, but yeah, I know it's, uh, it, it might even point to like, I'm just, I'm just hypothesizing here, but it might even point to areas where they originated from, right? Or who preserved them, right? Like what era was it? Like, I doubt it was preserved in Gonda, the very like conservative, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like probably maybe, maybe it was preserved in a place like Dredoa or, you know what I mean? Other more liberal. Yeah, Dredoa or Harar, I could believe it more. Yeah. So it might even it might even point to like the terminology used in the in the tarots might actually point to where they came from. Yeah, it's it's good further research for us. Yeah. So if you ran out, I got I got a few more for you, Katakas King. Go ahead, I'll listen in. Kalamat ayek the jazma chenati karal. Yeah. Or yas karal. I might have. It's one of the two. That's the way I've heard it. Okay, so. Dead jazz match is one of these uh, masfin or maquan masafin or maquanent titles. You can get to it either through merit or through birth, and it means gate commander or commander of the outside. And it's one of these heavy titles which gets very close to king. Uh, to be honest, once you get to dead jazz match, you're practically a king. You have dead jazz match, ras, bitwed dead, negus, 
and Nagusa Nagast, which are all, I think, jurisdictionally the same amount of territory, uh, except for Nagusa Nagast, which is the king of kings, which it's a relatively like you could rule the same amount of territory and have any of these titles. So it's one of the highest possible titles that you can get in Ethiopian history in the Christian kingdom. And um, uh, so like, again, you could have it by birth or you could have it through merit, but whatever you do, you know, kind of after that levels you up and then you're basically up, you could be king one day, you know, if the right situation occurs, you might be king. And so it says, it, it goes back to the assertiveness of the saying Johannes said earlier, trying to get people to be more assertive. Is there's a chance or an opportunity that you may not become a gate commander if you never ask to be a gate commander. I think the Americanism that's uh, close to that is it seems to be a more modern saying is you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So shoot your shot especially you gentlemen and especially you ladies shoot your shot ask the question pray your prayer to god whatever the context may be you, you have any thoughts on this saying yeah it just it points to the the, the value of questioning right um i i heard it but when i heard this one it was always in the context of schooling and it was like ask your teachers if you don't understand something and what like or else like you won't improve, you won't get better. If there's stuff you don't know, always ask. Uh, the uh, another one I like the similar similar medica uh, I think if I'm not mistaken. And to become an alaka, like a leak or like a someone that's in charge or in power, a uh, scholar, a learned person, a boss, you need to ask and kind of inform yourself. Um and then also, obviously, it always came with know who to ask as well. Like, don't just ask any random person, but ask someone that knows, right? Um, Amen. So that's where I heard it all the time. It's always in the context of school and um, to be questioning of my teachers. I've asked a lot of people a lot of questions and a lot of people have been pestered by them. But I have, through discernment and through trial and error, learned which people actually want to help you. So I have about three people I usually go to, you know, you, you are more of a peer, but I have three people and I, and I ask you too, you know, as a peer, who's pretty learned on the subject, but I have three people I go to, two are here in LA. One is in DC who, when I ask them a question about Amharic or especially Giz, they will answer my question nine times out of 10. And that one time out of 10, they'll look it up and they'll know where to answer it if they can't. And that's, it's so useful to, to have mentors, like, like you mentioned. That's great. So the next one, so before you wrap your head with the Ethiopian turban, that is the signifier of the Deptara class or the Halakha class of the learned folks, make sure you're worthy of it. Make sure you've actually learned what you're supposed to do. So I think... It's good to ask for things. There's a good tension and balance here. It's good to ask for things. It's good to reach. It's good to be assertive. But don't just fake it till you make it. Make sure that you're prepared so that when you when you get to, to be tested, that you pass the test. You got any thoughts on Yeah, it's also like make yeah make, like make sure you're ready before you put cuz the thing is once you got the tumtum on you've put yourself out out there like the notice is out that this person knows everything that that thing represents right is worthy of the honor or the of the title that is associated with that tumtum it, it kind of goes back to I, I was listening to Daniel Kipper at one time where at some point I, feel, I want to say like maybe 4 or 5 years ago in Ethiopia there was this like time where all these like award committees were being established and everyone was being called a laureate like these random people <laughs> laureate, laureate, laureate. and like there was no like mesfart there was no criteria like a unifying criteria that makes someone worthy of that like marag of that title so the the the, the title loses its it like it loses its value, right? It depreciates or becomes desecrated type of thing. Um, now, 
the honor of the whole title, everybody's, and, and, and I've heard it in school as well, where certain instructors have always said, because uh, on some universities, like they're like, yeah, we don't fail anyone. If everyone fails, we'll just like, um, we'll curve it or something so that X amount of people pass type of thing. And I always, I remember one chemistry teacher in first year, she's like, no, I'm not going to do that because if I do that and I qualify someone for a degree that, um, that is that that person does not have the inherent knowledge for. She says she said it cheapens my degree. Like it because she has the same degree from the same school. She said like, it cheapens my degree to have someone that's not worthy of the honor in the same group as me. It brings the whole the whole. So similar to that. So like like from a church context, if any bishop or whatever is about, is gonna lay hands and give a title to someone. They better make sure that that person is worthy of the position, right? Or else the whole, the whole, it's the whole institution that kind of takes the hit, right? So it's not necessarily just an individualistic saying, like in terms of it's not just for you as an individual putting on the tum-tum, but also everyone that that's associated with the tum-tum better be kind of watchful of who, who they led into the group type of thing. I like that. Protect, protecting the, the value of the institution. Yeah. In my local parish, we got about 15 or 19 little, little young deacons at one point. And it's a phenomenon you see everywhere else. So you see deacons who tend to be my age, they don't like being called deacon anymore because somehow mm -hmm. this great biblical title is beneath them. So they'll come up with a million different titles there'll be maggabi this, lika this, and lika that. And so, yeah, it, it's very interesting. Uh, the, the gentleman you mentioned for a long time was Diakon Daniel Kibret, but eventually they did give him the title Muhazat Ababat. Yeah. So even he eventually got it different. But it was interesting because he was probably the oldest person that I know who was referred to as Diakon at the time. Most people, when they get 30s and 40s, they don't want to be called that anymore. So they have different titles. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. I'll move to the next one. This one I think was unique to my aunt. She was putting on a fake voice one time and prank calling me. And she was talking about me and this idea of whether I'm Ethiopian or I'm American. And she says to me, but distim bitwaled dimmet wet atonim. That was hilarious to me. So normally, you know, a cat is born somewhere in the wild. She might be born in some domesticated place. But if she so happened to be born in a pot, it wouldn't make her magically turn into a stew, right? A chicken stew or something. So she still retains her catness. So even though this Ethiopian was born in the diaspora, you can take the Ethiopian out of Ethiopia, right? But you can't take it out of him. Yeah. Uh, I never heard of that one before. It's the first time. I, I, I think she made that. it up. I think she made <laughs> it up to the prank call me. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a funny one. I mean, uh, but I guess it kind of we, we kind of brought up the idea earlier with like, is it are we mut mutable and immutability? Immutability. Hopefully, I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, are it, is our character mutable? Can we change? Is there a change, or are we hopelessly um, in in this in one state, and there's no room for change type thing? I think we talked we talked about it earlier with um, uh, with Ethiopia and America. I think the Matfuzinf or the the extremists in America would think everything is mutable, and I think the extremists in Ethiopia yeah. would think everything is is uh, immutable. Yeah, I think we've got I would love to ask you if you had to throw a percentage at each, what percentage of us do you think is nature versus nurture? What what percentage is mutable? What percentage is immutable? Uh, it's very difficult to quantify. I mean, I, I feel I feel everything is mutable. Well, not everything, but like a majority of things are mutable, but within a certain bound, right? And I think that's what you said earlier, where. The biology gives you a certain, you, or the chess game example that we gave, where you have rules that you can't change, but then within those rules you can, you can be different, right? Um, so I don't know. It's really tough to put a number to it, so I can't give a percent, but there is, 
or at least I, I can't put a percent to it to any accurate degree here. But all right, I just got a few more for you. Fre amazaf you gonna besan. Fre amazaf you gonna besan. So a fruitful tree bends over, and I think this one's pretty clear. But it's that people who are humble are great. So Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, someone I've recommended to many people. He's a father confessor as well. And he said somebody came to him one time and said, Father, how can I grow in humility? And he said, my son, my son, you cannot grow into humility. You must shrink. You must decrease. And so even the, the terms humility in the original biblical languages, it has to do with lowliness. So you see a lot of the, the language, right? Those who no, are right. humble or lowly will be exalted. Zik zik rasa chon zik zik emiadergu kaf kaf yadergachwal. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who go high will be lowered. Those who go low will be made high. And so I think it, it means like if you're humble, it, you'll be fruitful. I don't know if you heard this one or have any thoughts. I, know, I haven't heard this one before. This is new to me too. But it kind of goes like I know you, you're, you're a big language guy. So, like with uh, in Giz, I know. Tuhut is the word for humble. And then in Amarna, I've, I've heard it like, um, like he's seen the lowliness or the the of of his slave. Um, and the, the Virgin Mary is the one who said it. Um, yeah. The Guz actually he, says Amatu, right? His female slave, his his handmaiden. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm the, the handmaiden of the Lord. Yep. Yeah. Um, but he, but she says yeah. um, even the one, word tahut you mentioned well, taita taita means the below right the touch and then mawarid warada is also like zik malit right so i felt you would appreciate the ling a linguistic interjection <laughs> and now that's all i got yeah. to add from that one no that's but, beautiful it shows yeah. the 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 semitic guz and amharic it's clear yeah. Again, for us, humble, the word humility might not be clear to us, but it might be clear to us when we think that humility comes from the same root as humiliation. That might clear some things up for us, right? Yeah. If you are made in low. English, in English, the word humility does not conjure up any, like the, there's no root word that means below or beneath or like on the ground, like on the, you know what I mean? Only, only when you realize that it's the same root, which means humiliation, which goes back to what do you bring to the table? So humiliation is a feeling that you feel when you are the same word you used. Yeah. That's what mawarad is in Amharic too. It's humiliation. But imagine translating what our ladies in the Magnificat, in the Ta'abbiyo, is you humiliated your handmaiden. So it's humiliation when it makes you feel bad, but if it makes you feel good, it's humility. <laughs> it's like, it, yeah. it's how you respond to the facts. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. For sure. Uh, oh, I wrote, we did that one already. Uh, he who eats by himself dies by himself. We did that one. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, even poison can become medicine in moderation. Yeah, that that that, that stirs up some biblical um, concepts for me, where like hulum tafakdon hulum like all is not like nothing's forbidden, but not everything is beneficial. Um, and it goes to that functionality where let's say like I, I, there's a certain points where I remember like I've gone to arguments with some people regarding like alcohol and stuff where it, it's the I think at some point I think it was Paulus Letimotius Lahode he says for your stomach may drink some some wine or something and then at the same time it says Sikhar is mutful like being like completely like wasted and and whatever is so like that exact same um action depending on how much and then obviously your response to it as well can be a good thing yeah. or a bad thing 
Um, so same thing here, uh, like something that's poison, if it, in a certain dosage could be bad, but in a certain dosage, it could be helpful. So to me, that points to like an Ethiopian society that doesn't look at actions per se, like the action in and of itself, but to what end are you doing it? Um, and what is the end result of it? I think we, we brought that up earlier with one of them. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, case by case. Everything is case by case. You, you someone tries to become dogmatic, and again, we have dogma. It's very narrow. Our dogma is very narrow, and we're stringent about it. We have dogma, but outside of that, everything is case by case. People want to make one rule for all times and all places, right? Yeah. You have thou shall not steal, but then you have Jesus talking about how David when he was hungry and almost dying with his friends goes and steals the bread from the priests and eats from it. Yeah. One or of my friends, he always likes to bring that up to, uh, to justify yeah. using the water cup to get soda at restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or he's like, no, don't work on the Sabbath and then do good deeds on that, that day or to eat or whatever. There's a lot of, do you ever oh, yeah. seen Princess Bride? Princess Bride is one of my favorite movies and a spoiler alert, but this movie's from the 80s, so really not. Uh, but there's a portion in the movie where there are two guys engaged in the scene and he he puts uh, poison in one of these cups and he, he switches around, switches around, switches around. You don't know which one is which. And so the guy drinks the cup. And so he's like, oh, well, if he drank, then it must be okay. So then he drinks it too. What happened is both cups were poisonous, but that guy had spent his life drinking a little bit of poison every day. So he had built up a tolerance or resistance. The same idea and concept goes in like when people, when mothers try to be a helicopter mothers and they sanitize their children too much, they don't let them play in a dirty environment. Their immune system gets weaker so that when they're eventually exposed to that greater disease, they're in trouble. This is a greater theme that Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the Orthodox Christian probabilist, wrote about in his Black Swan book, which was very famous, where he predicted the financial crisis of 2007, but also in the larger Incerto that includes skin in the game, anti-fragile, and a lot of these concepts that have become popularized in, in many areas. The next one I have for you, I might, I might have butchered this one, so you fix it. I think you might know it. Uh, have you heard that one? My aunt used to say that oh. one a lot. I never heard that one. Yeah, it's more of a, a, a secular saying. This one definitely goes. So this one shows the looming second advent or second judgment, the second coming of Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead is always in the background of the Ethiopian society. One of my friends, Deacon Mahadi, is one of the people, he's a former professor of Guz and Amharic. I'm gonna get him on the program eventually at Addis Ababa University. He's picked up now Coptic, Syriac, Arabic, and Hebrew. So he really is the new Alek uh, Akidana Wal Kifli, if I may, Mamog uh, is one of my friends. Uh, I'd love to introduce him to you actually. But, um, uh, you know, oh man, I, I think I lost it. Uh, oh, uh, you know, the important point is that like this second coming or the second advent, this judgment is in everybody's minds. Everybody's thinking about it. What he says, what, what Deacon Mahadi says, is that it's not that there are churches in Ethiopia. It's that effectively, when especially when we're talking about this Christian kingdom, they made the Ethiopian empire itself a church. Like the city itself makes itself in a circle an encampment, which is where the word encampment comes from, around the churches. And the society is is has so much gibra gab, so much ethics and morals, it, it like forms the society itself is the temple, is the church. And so in that case, you have in the background, everybody's constantly like the assumption is that the Trinity is real. The assumption is that judgment is coming. But some people, yitachalu. Some people may may be looking at in disdain and may poke at the underlying assumptions of the society. So they say, even if kunani or judgment is not true, it's probably still a good idea to live a righteous life. 
Okay. Yeah, I never, I've never heard that one before. That's the first time I've heard it. In philosophy, it's related to something called Pascal's Wager, where this Western uh, theologian philosopher actually came up with some sort of math, like if God exists, if God doesn't exist, da 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 da, da, da and there's eternal Ooh. fire and. Is it that four, that four, like a four square table or something? Yeah, that's called Pascal's Wager. Where the only, if you, if you're, if you're beginning from the premise of avoiding the worst or avoiding a negative outcome, then it's better to act as if, and I, and I always hear Jordan Peterson talking like about, he's like, I, I live as if God is watching or something. Like he, when they ask him like, do you believe in God? He's like, that's tough. That's a tough question to answer, but I live as though he exists. Type of thing. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, the mentality. And, yeah. and my aunt, she's passed away a few years ago now, but she, and she's not my blood aunt. She was my, my mom's good friends, but you know, most of her friends I'd say were generally secular. They grew up in this time, you know, when Marxism was spreading everywhere. So I think, you know, people were generally secular. They were the second main generation. I think our grandparents were the first modernizers. So they're like the second generation of modernizers. They've not only moved out of the rural areas into the city, but now they've moved from the city of Addis Ababa to the bigger cities in the West. And so I think that they had this general secularism, but especially towards the end of her life, you know, she used to ask everybody to pray for her. You know, she'd be like, Hiruta Selassie, that's my name, go pray for me. And I remember a, a, another kind of aunt friend of ours said, this woman probably has like a thousand people and like 30 different Abbas praying in all these churches on, on her behalf. And so she really believed you could see in, in the intercession of, of the saints, uh, you know, the church militant, the yeah. churches is, is here right now. And, uh, you know, so I think the general milieu was secular at the same time a lot of these people, especially in the environments I grew up in, environments you grew up are very thoroughly culturally orthodox. And so these underlying assumptions are there. I'll let you translate and say this one. I'm pretty sure you know this one. Kas bakas enkulal bagroate dalich? Yeah. Um, slowly, an egg starts walking on its feet, essentially. That the, that one, the way that one's translated, and a guy kind of goes through the the chicken, the hatching process of the chick. Does it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight, but slowly the the chick, oh, what do you call it? Um, cracks the egg and slowly and, and surely. And I guess over the period, I'm not sure. I don't know the the process of hatching, but I know how it occurs over a few a day or two or whatever it is. Um, and she comes out of the egg and starts walking. So. If things things don't happen overnight, things take time, um, things take effort. The chick has to like kind of peck right from from inside there to break to break the shell wide open. Um, so to me, and, and the other the other thing too that that I I've, I've heard that one brought up to me was once I remember I was doing something, but I wasn't see I wasn't seeing the results that I wanted to. Um, and then I remember I think it was with the, I think yeah it must have been the, the when I was playing the trumpet I think so grade six you had to play an instrument here in Canada you're forced to kind of learn an instrument I picked up the trumpet um, and I did it for a few years there but at the beginning it's like a it's a, the learning curve is high right so you gotta you gotta pick up a lot you don't really see the results and you're not able to play like long songs you're still learning how to the, what the notes are how to read music um, and and I, I, that's when I, when I, first time I think I heard this, this saying brought up, um, the chicken keeps working from inside for a numerous, and then one day it just cracks open and then like, it's finally free type of thing. So you might not see the results of your effort immediately or like kind of like in correlation with the work you're putting in at first, but all the benefits will come like they're, 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 they're growing. It's just, you can't see them yet. And that same thing, that egg is weakening. It's just, it hasn't cracked yet, but it will eventually. You hear it another way or? What, what, yeah, one, uh, same way, but I'll add to it. I'll add my own, come on, or spice here. One of my favorite writers, Malcolm Gladwell, famous uh, writer at The New Yorker, you know, the kind of magazine par excellence for what's considered high culture in the United States in New York City. 
uh, the kind of king of cosmopolitan areas, the only place bigger than my own city of LA. He has a you know famous book, Blink, another famous book, Tipping Point. I have his book, David and Goliath, but one of his big books was called Outliers. And in there, he didn't invent this, but he popularized the idea that if you don't put 10,000 hours into something, don't say you're not good at it. Like literally don't try something once, twice, three times, or even five times, like put 10,000 hours. Now his critics come back and say, well, not all 10,000 hours are equal. And that's right. Like they have to be 10,000 educated hours, skillful hours. They can't just be mindless. So think critically, do act and tinker, but really put your time into something before you just immediately give up, which I think is the encouraging point mm -hmm. behind how you are understanding it. My, fam my favorite person in the jujitsu world and in the MMA world is a coach named John Dana Hare. Now this guy almost finished his PhD. He did not in philosophy from Columbia University. While he was doing that, he was teaching jujitsu. And I believe he basically applied his PhD wisdom to the world of jujitsu and to the world of MMA. He is the coach of the coach and directly of the fighter, George St. Pierre, GSP, who's an arguable one of the best of all time, certainly in the welterweight division of the UFC. And he's from rural Canada. So shout out to you Canadians. And he's also behind many, many people in the jiu-jitsu world, greats like Gordon Ryan and Gary Tonin, who's now moved to MMA. And if you've seen his Instagram bio, he doesn't have much written, but he's spoken about this in many places. He uses the Japanese concepts a lot. And one Japanese concept he's attached to is something called Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N. And Kaizen is a business philosophy, but it's also a way of life and outlook that you improve little by little every day and after a while, you'll be surprised. So what he's done to revolutionize the world of MMA and jiu-jitsu is he's done scientific rigorous studies of what are the highest percentage submission holds. He's taken those submission holds and he drills those hundreds and thousands of times. He doesn't care about drilling the submission holds that are not the most frequent. He just takes the six or seven or so most frequent submission holds and he has his people literally drilling them seven days a week. And he believes that within a five-year period, right? He doesn't even say 10,000 hours. He says, if you train four to seven times a week and you're drilling hundreds and thousands of times in a five-year period, you'll be super surprised that you can be one of the top athletes on earth, especially in jujitsu and in MMA. And I think people could have apply that philosophy elsewhere. I only have one more for you and it'll be our last one. Congratulations, Tagus King. This is officially the longest podcast episode I've done yet. We have reached Joe Rogan levels and I've done it through uh, my long lost twin, Johannes and me, and uh, very close to the Johannes holiday as well. I don't know if you're named after John the Baptist or John the Evangelist or John Chrysostom, but I think you've got a, a little bit of each in you. <laughs> the evangelist, the evangelist, man. <laughs> the evangelist. Okay. Well, then I think we're closing. I think this is John. We're in John right now, if I'm not mistaken. So I think we're going to enter 2013 in the Guz calendar, which should be Matthew. I could be wrong. Yeah. I yeah. I think it. I think you're right. You're right. Yes. So we're we're closing the the year 2012 in the Guz calendar. Remember, everybody thought it was going to be the Mayan calendar where the world's ending. Well, here we are in 2020, but it's really 2012 according to the Guz calendar, which might be the the realest calendar out there. And uh, so we think the end of the world is approaching. Look forward to September 11th, not to be confused with the terrorist attacks. September 11th is New Year's Day, according to the Guz calendar, when we will be leaving this horrid 2012 in the view of a lot of people, leaving the year dedicated to the evangelist John, entering the year dedicated to the evangelist Matthew, and entering the lovely 2013. And we've talked a lot of church stuff. So my last one, here we go. It might be sexist. It might be descriptive or normative. There is no such thing as a woman or a clergy who is a clergyman who is a guest. And my understanding is that there is this expectation and duty that a woman, no matter what house she's, she's at, she should do her part in the kitchen or anywhere else in the service of the people there to be hospitable and that she's not really a guest. In the same way, a clergyman 
never really owns a church. The clergy, like hierarchy exists because the clergy are in charge of parishes and individual parishes. But if they go to another parish, they don't just get the chill in the audience. They have to take part and serve the people who are there because they are not a guest, but they are a slave of God. And so they have a certain duty attached to it. What do you think about it? Is uh, it, it is obviously descriptive. I don't know if it is normative. Do you think it's sexist or what do you think about this last saying? Uh, well, definitely sexist. The first part, at least. Well, you can say the second, the second part too, because there's no there's no female clergy, right? So it's def there's definitely a balance. I gotta give it that because it gives you the the Asian Gedalim, but that's met in a sense of when women are invited to someone's house, they're expected to kind of get their hands dirty in the kitchen and serve and whatever, um, and then. But then there's a male equivalent for the clergy who do the same thing, but however, in a church environment as opposed to um, someone's house. Um, so it's definitely, I'd say it's a balanced sexist <laughs> tarot for sure. Um, but yeah, I've, I've heard I've heard that said, and, that, and that's the exact one. It's pretty straightforward. It's literal. Um, the context I've heard it mostly. I've never. It's never really applied to in the in the in the clergy context. It's always in a woman context where, like, let's say someone's invited. A husband and a wife or something and then um let's say my mom or it could be the other way around let's say we invited people over or we're invited to someone's house it's usually the husband of the person or sorry the wife of the person that's been invited um of one of the husband that's been invited so let's say it's me and my mom our family has been invited to someone's house my dad would be like if my dad sees his friend's wife just cooking or something, preparing the kitchen. He'll tell my mom, oh, go like help out like or something like that. Or vice versa, where my mom's doing something and then the person that's invited would tell his wife, like go help her out or something. And yeah, obviously it, it, I think it, if we look at it in a good sense, it just kind of points to like everyone pitches into something kind of with the Hamsalomi versus the Hamsalso versus the Andeso, um, where if you kind of work together, um, it makes the work easier whether it's setting up or cleaning up, if everyone pitches in, then it's less work um, in the end and everyone gets to enjoy more. Um, so I think it's a pretty function, like it's, it's got a good functional um, uh, like meaning to it. And I've seen it applied a lot. And I think it's, it's one of the good ones. We should keep it. I'm but with you we, there. We can, throw, we can throw in the guys too. Guys can help too. You know? See, I, I like this because... Um... I've mentioned elsewhere in, in a recent episode where I was interviewed by this gentleman, uh, Shelley from Kristen Shelley from England, that I am a gadfly. I'm a man who's a man of the cloth. I'm a man who's a man of the institution, but I find my role in the institution to be the gadfly of the institution. I used to be one of the biggest critics of the kings, but I saw all these people lying about the kings and I said, hold on, well, now I got to defend the kings. All right. You know, I used to be the guy who wants to be like Alec Agabrahanna, always, you know, uh, making snide remarks about kings. But again, mm -hmm. people can make snide remarks, but they got to be based in fact. And when, when people start twisting the narrative too much, I say, hold on, now I got to balance it the other way. Johannes has always been the balance in my life as a person who I think is defending, making an apologetic for the institutions, for the status quo as they are, but not doing it in a mindless way. I think he's he's one of the most intelligent defenders of the status quo I have ever met. Other people I see defending certain things of the status quo, they do it very unintelligently. So I've always think that he's balanced my kind of inner gadfly with his um, with his defense or apologias. And so I thank him for that. And we have many, many different kind of linguistic uh, ideas and other things we're going to do. At this moment, you know, we're coming to a close. If you have anything to, to plug, I know you're not a big social media guy, but if you have anything to plug, I know at least YouTube counts as a social media and you've done your part to show what an English liturgy and the good is right would be like. I don't know if you want to plug that or if, if there's anything else you do want to plug, now would be a good time. If not, then you could just give us a nice Kala Yeah, no, no, nothing, nothing really to plug, honestly. Um... Like it was nice, nice, definitely nice having this chat. I know, I know that the inspiration behind it was um, that video I did with my sister, um, where I kind of was testing her on these. Um, I, for me, like, and the reason why we, I did that all in the beginning was there was always this 
um, kind of was a given that to be to, to, to be able to claim that you are an Amarinya speaker, to know Amarinya, like I remember like people, either my parents or friend, their friends or whatever people, all older people from Ethiopia that I was around, they always made it a given that I had to be able to kind of know, first of all, memorize, and then properly apply these sayings or these these tarots, these idioms um, in in like an everyday context. And at, only at that point are you considered to be like a proper Amaringa speaker. And I feel that it's one of, or I've, I've come to, to come to know that it is one of the ways in which the values of the society you can you can easily get a good grasp of if you if you if you're very if you become if you end up becoming familiar with the with not every not every single one but with a majority um, or at least the most common of these you will you will have a really good understanding of the people or the culture that they came from and the values that that culture has. Um, and that was the reason why I even tested my sister on these and even taught it to her in the first place. Um, and I encourage everyone to try and learn them. Um, I'm pretty sure there are some books and stuff you can get your hands on online even. Um, and and so remember everyone, him and his sister born and raised in Ottawa, Canada, and still were able to learn all of these Amharic Aphor aphorisms as as we do come to a close do you do you have any sort of explanation well i assume not everybody in canada in the ethiopian community is quite like your sister and you otherwise i'll be very surprised any any sort of factors you can you can point to are you two just such special individuals or are there communal factors or biological factors that predisposed you to this uh, I don't know. Like, 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 there might be some inherent type of receptibility to language. Um, like, I catch on pretty quick with languages. But I, that's the thing. I've only had like a legitimate. I've only had a legitimate opportunity to be exposed to. I would say, three to three, not three languages, Amharic and English fully, and then I would say maybe is in French in a in a, like in a half type of way. Um, French, obviously living in Canada, Canada, bilingual country, English, French, for every day for like 50 minutes. I guess similar to how you guys with Spanish there. Um, a, a little less so though. It's more, it's more formal in Ottawa. Yes, it is more formal. So I was, I, I, I was pretty good. Like I always got good grades and stuff in French, but the thing is with me in French, you're only forced to take it up to grade 10. And I stopped after that. So I literally, I haven't spoken French in like, um, 10, 11 years, 12 years, maybe 11 years. Yeah. So, and I don't really watch anything in French movies or TV or anything. So like, I kind of, I'm starting to lose it and I've lost it. Um, like Giz is another one. I always say in a limited sense, because obviously you only get it from the church. Um, but but then, you like, speak, you speak Giz Labbas Amharic. And so I like having French Labbas English where you can say there's a je ne sais quoi fait accompli at our rendezvous in the par excellence that we're taking part in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't consider that knowing that's, that's okay. We, we, we can consider that. And that's why I'll give it the half point. So like, there I are a lot of people people who wouldn't know that there are a lot of people who wouldn't know that, but I, you know, yeah, but that's not like, you wouldn't say, you know, the language just because you know that. Right. No. So like I'm saying I've probably been half exposed to French and half exposed to so in, 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 in summation, I would say three languages that I've been exposed to. The two that I've been exposed to fully, obviously, I can speak. And then the two that I've been exposed to in in part, I can speak in part. So I feel there it might be some type of inherent receptibility to language. I don't know if that's scientifically proven, if that exists or not. Um, but additionally to that, I would just say, man, my parents just spoke it to me in the house. Um, I didn't really go to preschool or anything or daycare as a kid. So I think my first exposure to English was when I went to junior kindergarten. Um, so I think that helped kind of growing up in the house with my mom who spoke Amarina, um, and kind of delaying that exposure to English that might've helped as well. Um, but yeah, I would, I wouldn't, I would definitely not say it's not, it's not, it's not completely an inherent thing. I mean, if anyone puts in the time and the effort to read, um, like I remember my mom used to teach, I used to, I used to not like it too. 
I, sometimes like Saturday mornings, she would get these books, um, whether it's the Bible or just ma- even like magazines, Ethiopian magazines, and make me read them in the mornings on Saturdays when there's no school. Um, and that helped me read and write. And then once you know how to read and write, then you're self-sufficient. You can like um, look up How old stuff. were you when you learned how to read and write in Amharic? I'll probably say it started pretty early. I would say like six, seven. Um, and so I was started, delayed. I was illiterate till 21. Till 21, yeah. And then um, I think church helped too with the, with like Adasi and stuff, how it's like said slowly. And they got the PowerPoints up there. So that kind of helps you follow like letters with the what's being said. If um, you show up on time. If you show up on time, yeah. <laughs> so that helps with reading because you get to hear and see and read at the like, same time. You're immersed. Yeah, you're immersed in it. And, so, and, it's, and it's very repetitive, right, on a weekly basis. So you know that really well. Um, and that kinda, that's kind of like a springboard for you to delve into other things. Um, so it's, it's just a matter of exposure to me. And I feel now it's a lot easier with like, you can go on YouTube and you find multiple, like millions and whatever videos of like in Amaringa and whatever, Tigringa, whatever language you speak and you can probably, you can so probably bo- catch on pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, then I, then I'm 